Se ofrecen servicios de interpretación en español para esta reunión del Consejo Municipal por teléfono. Marque el número 720-386-9023 y utilice el código 104091 estrella. Thank you, Mr. Gibson. If you're a council member, please be sure to unmute your microphone for the broadcast and recording. Go ahead and get this study session underway. We were originally going to have six presentations. However, the commercial development activities and market update will be moved to a future study session because one of the presenters is unable to make tonight's meeting. We'll move on to the 120th Avenue widening IGA terms. We'll invite Jenna Lowry, management analyst, to introduce the presentation. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. It's been a moment since I was here, so I appreciate the patience. Um, for tonight's 120th Avenue presentation, we will review the need to widen and improve 120th from Chambers to Buckley, discuss the proposed intergovernmental agreement terms between the City and the Buffalo Ridge Metropolitan District, and seek Council feedback for drafting the IGA based on terms presented tonight, and that IGA would come before you here in the upcoming week. So this conversation regarding the section of 120th Avenue is important because the roadway is not wide enough to serve residents or visitors in that corridor. The necessary improvements that will allow for better and safer traffic flow from Chambers to Buckley do include installing two additional lanes and associated improvements, upgrading the signal at 120th and Chambers, signalizing the 120th and Buckley intersection, relocating an existing sanitary sewer line and undergrounding existing overhead utility lines. Since this project was first conceptualized in 2019, the required improvements have gone up in both scope and cost. City Council previously approved contributing funds for road improvements, including the funding of the relocation of the sanitary sewer line. For some additional context, the city initially pledged $1 million to this project in 2019, then budgeted an additional $1.8 million in 2021 for increased project costs. Similarly, the Buffalo Ridge Metropolitan District initially pledged $1 million, then agreed to contribute an additional $1 million. Based on updated construction drawings, cost estimates, and the conversations we've had with outside entities, both the Buffalo Ridge Metropolitan District and city staff have negotiated terms to share project costs and responsibility. Um, Adams County is unable to contribute their 2022 CIP funds towards this project, and the Water District has been very involved in discussions with staff to ensure proper relocation of that sanitary sewer line. You do have the complete draft term sheet that the staff and Metro District agreed upon in tonight's packet, but the key terms for you to take away for the Metro District are that Buffalo Ridge has now agreed to commit a total of $4.1 million to the project. This amount includes all design work and project management costs for the south side of the road, all road work and improvements for the south side, and landscaping installation on the south side until the district's project budget is exhausted. So looking at city responsibilities for the current term sheet, the city will be responsible for undergrounding the overhead electrical lines, and that portion of the project will be funded utilizing the city's 1% franchise agreement funds that we have with United Power, relocating that existing sanitary sewer line, all improvements associated with the north half of the roadway, including design work and project management, 
Once the district project budget runs out, the city will finish landscaping for the south side of the roadway. And finally, the city will install native seating on the north side of the roadway. So with all of those obligations, um, city contributions total $4.9 million. Separate from the IGA terms for this project with the Metro District is a discussion about the intersection at 117th Avenue in Chambers. Council previously requested that staff analyze the signalization of this intersection. And in August of 2021, a signal warrant analysis was conducted and those results did show that the intersection does not meet warrants to install a signal. That said, when traffic flow does warrant a signal, signalization will be reconsidered, but as a city only project. So the discussion for tonight is whether council supports drafting an IGA based on these terms presented. If so, we'll have the IGA come before you on March 7th and then again on April 4th. And during this time period, our design work will continue over the coming months and construction on the actual improvements will begin in either Q3 or Q4 of 2022. Thank you for your time. I'm available to answer questions and our city engineer, Brent Sutherland, should be on the line as well. Thank you very much, ma'am. Does anybody on council have any questions? Council member Madera. So um, is the north side of the 120th there, is that not um, Brighton's? It is not, no. Not anymore. They uh, de-annexed that area. It has yet to annex into Commerce City, but that was part of the agreement with Brighton. Okay, so that's why we would be um, responsible for the entire north side? Yes. Okay, thank you. The fire station there is not considered in Commerce City, correct? My apologies, Mayor. The exact location for the fire station? Northwest corner of Buckley and 120th. The, the northwest corner is not within, right. not correct. within the, the city. Uh, Roger shaking his head, yes. I may have my corners miss. No, I think you're right. After you described it, that sounds like it's still Adams County. So back to Councilmember Madera's question. You asked about part of it still being in Brighton. I thought that question was about the northwest corner of the intersection of Chambers on 120th. Well, this project is basically going to go from Cameron to Buckley. Buckley. Right. So there are portions of the project on the north side of the roadway that are not in Commerce City. Correct. That Commerce City voters are being asked to fund for a jurisdiction that is not in their control. That is correct. But again, do we want a partial improvement or a full improvement? That, that's the dilemma. And Adams County said no when, when our staff talked to them. That is correct. Any other questions? Councilmember Noble. Um, is there a way to line up 120th and Chambers so as you're driving north on Chambers, you keep going straight? Right now, it jogs by uh, Santiago's. Uh, Brent, I'm going to turn that over to you as our resident expert. You've been looking at the construction drawing, so can you speak to that? Sure. So, yeah, thank you for the question, Council um, Woman Noble. So. We are planning to redo that entire intersection of 120th and Chambers um, to make that whole intersection line up. Um, one of the one of the issues that issues that we're dealing with at 120th and Chambers is that we really need double um, leftbound turn lanes for that northbound to westbound movement, and so um, basically we're we're redoing that entire intersection to accommodate all that traffic. Good, yes, there is a lot of traffic at that, at that yes. point. Thank you very much. Uh, it, is, so everything is okay with the Buffalo Mesa Metro District on this? They have the money set aside. 
There's going to be no surprises for the residents there in terms of, oh, guess what? That is correct, ma'am. They, they've got the money aside in their capital program. Uh, and in the packet tonight, you would have um, a letter was received from them confirming that they do have that for the project going forward. And that letter is just from a couple, couple of weeks ago, so they're still on, on part of the project. Okay, and, and um, I read the term sheet, and I didn't see anything in there that jumped out at me in terms of um, sacrificing anything in that neighborhood in order for this project to go through. Is that correct? That is correct, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from council? I have a question regarding the comment about a uh, traffic signal at 117th and Chambers. And uh, I believe that whenever this was actually coming around, the question was regarding a traffic signal to be located at 120th and Cameron so that residents leaving out of the north side. Are we looking at 120th and Cameron getting a traffic signal or not? Uh, Brent, I know you looked into that as well. Can you speak to that? Sure, so uh, staff did do a traffic signal warrant analysis for 120th and Cameron, and it does not meet warrants. Um, we also had um, the developers, or I should say the Buffalo Run uh, Metro District's engineer, look, traffic engineer, look at that. And he agreed with us that it's not signalized. Um, what I think we're gonna see though, is once we improve the intersection of 120th and Chambers, that folks are really gonna be able to get in and out of Buffalo Run West and Buffalo Run East a lot better. And what was the reasoning why it didn't warrant a traffic signal at that intersection? Sure, so really the, the main warrant that we're looking at for a particular location like that is the side street traffic volumes. And you know, there's not enough houses really there to ever generate enough side street traffic to um, warrant a signal there. The other issue we have with Cameron is also that there's poor sight distance over the top of the, of the bridge. And so, you know, not only is it not meeting uh, signal warrants, it also has a sight distance issue with the, the bridge over 76. And did we determine that there wasn't enough traffic before or after we put the no left turn sign up? Well, the no, the no left turn sign was a result of the poor sight distance. Right. And so that, um, that was the reason for installing that. Understandable. So at what point in time did we calculate the amount of traffic volume going through that intersection before we told residents not to use the intersection or after we told them not to use the intersection? I think we calculated the, the, that volume before we signed it, no left turn. Um, I believe the, the request for the no left turn was generated through the PD, if I remember correctly. So I'm having a hard time squaring this in my head. On one hand, we say, it's not safe for you to make a left turn at this intersection, but on another hand, we say, but it doesn't warrant a traffic signal. So where do we expect these vehicles to go in order to make that left turn onto westbound 120th? So that was the, one of the reasons we looked at the intersection of 117th in Chambers. Um, and the reason we looked at that is because that would serve both Buffalo Run West and Buffalo Run East. Um, I still don't think that it's a safe movement to try to take that left turn. And I mean, obviously, if you put a signal there, right, it would make it safe. But it it has some issues, the, the sight distance, and it's relatively close to 120th and Chambers. I, I do think that with the increased operational performance at 120th and Chambers, that people won't need to make that movement anymore. They'll be able to come out on the chambers and use the, the traffic signal at 120th and chambers and really be able to, to get out of the, the neighborhood more efficiently. But how do we alleviate the sight distance problems we have for those vehicles trying to turn northbound onto chambers from Buffalo Run West? We have medians so, that are out there that are typically overgrown with weeds that block the view. Even trying to pull out from the storage unit, you have blocked view and you have two lanes of traffic with motorists continually driving at speeds well above the speed limit. 
So are we saying to the residents that live in that neighborhood, there is no safe, safe way for you to leave your neighborhood? Well, I think what we should consider is possibly this traffic signal at 117th and Chambers. Oh, well, you just said it wasn't warranted. It is not warranted, that's true. Um, I guess what, what I'll say is that if I was gonna put an unwarranted signal in, I would rather do it at 117th and Chambers because it's far enough away from the intersection. And that would be something that we could consider. What about the students that live there that need to walk over to Prairie View Middle School and Prairie View High School? How do we expect them to walk to school? Well, they should be able to go to the traffic center at 112th or 120th and Chambers and, and use the upgraded signal to cross over. And we're adding sidewalk along the north side, um, which will get them to the bridge. Um, and actually, on the other side, on the west side of the bridge, um, that particular area is in Brighton. And we have had discussions with the city of Brighton to possibly consider a safe routes to school grant to add that additional sidewalk so they could get to the school. But wouldn't it be safer to allow a signalized crossing right there at Cameron so that those students don't have to go all the way down to Chambers to make that crossing? Well, I mean, you could signalize it like I said, there's bad sight distance coming over the top of the hill, so it's probably not the best place for uh, pedestrians to actually cross. Okay. Any other questions from council? Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Next up, we have the Adams Tower tenant selection process. We'll invite Jenna Lowry again and Trenton Robinson, management analyst, to give the presentation. Thank you again, sir. I'm sure as many of you are aware, this is usually Mr. John Borgeli's project, but as he is out of office for a while on military leave, Trent and I are picking the project up. So we will um, be able to answer all of your questions going forward and appreciate your patience as we learn this together. So for tonight's presentation, we will review the project history and previous council direction, specifically regarding the fifth floor in the Adams Tower building. Um, we'll discuss proposals that staff received from Adams County and the Lur Urban Land Conservancy. And finally, we'll request council's direction on the tenant selection process. So the building referred to as Adams Tower is located at 7190 Colorado Boulevard and is the former Adams County Human Services building. The fifth floor of the building is 10,800 square feet. Per prior council direction, the city purchased the fifth floor from the Urban Land Conservancy for $1 million. At the time of the purchase, the vision was to utilize the space to support local nonprofit organizations. Various floor plan options that would support that vision were presented to council in Q4 of 2021. Council selected a flexible open floor concept that can house one to seven organizations in that shared space. The floor plan was included in the packet for this evening. At the time of floor plan selection, council also directed staff to select tenants from a competitive request for proposals process. Council also expressed a desire to lease the space below market rate and to solicit tenants from existing nonprofit organizations in Adams County Human Services. Um, staff is also planning to post the lease and RFP solicitation to social media, the Centennial Express, and the city website. That all said, while we were working to draft the RFP and lease agreement, staff did receive an unsolicited proposal from Adams County to lease the entire fifth floor. The county made this request because their current veteran service office space has outgrown its building and needs a larger space to accommodate the staff and services that they provide to veterans. Those services include affordable housing, mental health, community resources, and whole body health programs. 
The VSO staff identified the Adams Tower building as an ideal location for their services because of its close proximity to the light rail station, which provides easy public transportation to the Veterans Affairs Hospital and for connectivity with the VSO in Westminster. ADCO has offered to lease the fifth floor for $1 per square foot per month, which would be $10,800 on a monthly basis. ADCO's planned use will mirror the Veterans Service Center in Colorado Springs, which currently serves over 34,000 veterans. Accepting this proposal would give Commerce City the prestige of housing the second largest Veterans Service Center in Colorado, but there are some other factors to consider before a decision is made one way or the other. One of those factors is that since this presentation was made, staff received an additional solicitation from the Urban Land Conservancy. Um, since that request was recently received, we have not yet had a chance to go through due diligence, so we don't yet know what kind of lease structure ULC is looking for, but what we do know is that ULC would work with Tri-County Health to select tenants for the fifth floor that would support the community. Example tenants that they provided included those who offer legal services, child care support, heating assistance, and potentially any Think Library. But again, pricing, operational, and management logistics are unknown at this time for the ULC offer. The pros to selecting a single tenant for the fifth floor and specifically accepting the proposal laid out by Adams County are that Adams County would assume daily operational tasks, including opening the space, cleaning the space, ensuring proper conduct within the space, etc. This option would not require a new city staff person to open, operate, monitor, and close the space on a daily basis. And this use does guarantee that the entire space will be fully utilized. I say that because at this time, there's no indication one way or the other if we could find seven nonprofits who would want to utilize the fifth floor. And that's something we simply won't know until the RFP goes out to the community. The cons of selecting a single tenant are that ongoing maintenance costs, including repairing leaks, Wi-Fi, et cetera, would not be built into the price of the lease and would be the financial responsibility of the city. This option would also require a yearly financial source from the city to keep the space operational. If council does not want to move forward with a single tenant process, there are four different lease options to consider for this space. Um, regardless of the lease structure though, the city would need to generate $2,500 per month from each of the seven tenants in order to break even on operational management expenses, if that's the goal of council. So the first lease option we have is market rate. On that type of lease, rents the space at a gross amount that has operational and management expenses built into the lease price. Uh, when considering what the market rate would be, we do have to keep in mind that there is currently little office space in Commerce City, so that data is limited. However, um, there was approximately 530,000 square feet of office space in Commerce City in 2021. Uh, but when we compare that to 2020, office vacancy did rise to 2.9%, and the average lease rate fell 18.5% to $20.13 per square foot. The second lease option would be a triple net lease. Now that structure is also at a gross amount, um, but would quote operational and management expenses as an additional fee. So the exact lease amounts can vary based on the expenses for operating the floor. These leases are typically quoted as a per square foot price, which is not common with open and shared floor plans. And we usually, more, uh, usually see those types of leases more commonly for industrial spaces. So our third lease option is a formulaic lease, which is a calculated below market rate amount. It can be quoted per square foot or quoted as a per desk price, which is more common for office spaces. Example lease options with this structure are on the screen and these numbers were modeled using an office share with a floating floor plan from Wheat Ridge. Um, with this lease option, the city would not break even on costs. And our final option, of course, is a no charge lease where we would rent space to the nonprofits at no cost to the tenants. Um, but this does mean that all operational and management expenses would be the responsibility of the city. So the discussion for tonight is, you know, first and foremost, which tenant option would council like to pursue? 
um, option one being going with Adams County, and I guess option one B would be talking to the ULC further, and then option two is going back to the multi-tenant um, floor plan that you previously approved, and if we go that route, we'll have to talk about which lease structure you prefer. Um, the other option would be a combination where the city pursues leasing the entire space to either ADCO or the ULC, but then we do prepare the RFP as a backup. So I know there are a lot of options. I will leave this up to help guide our discussion. Thank you. I'd also like to note that Femi Clemens, Adams County's veteran service officer, is on the line to assist with questions about that specific proposal. Thank you both for that presentation. Does anybody on council have any questions? Council Member Madera. When does the RFP close for this? So we have not posted it yet. We wanted to get council's feedback. Um, regarding the proposals we received from Adams County and ULC before we posted the RFP. Yeah, I think it's a little premature to bring this, you know, before council because I've been getting um, communications from other organizations that are interested in the space, and they've been also coming up with proposals for um, you know joint uses and and having like organizations that complement each other to go into that space. So. No, I just don't think it's fair to, you know, bring this back for a decision or guidance without opening that for RFP and seeing what's out there and what what best fits the needs of the community because there are several organizations that have reached out and so I think we need to put that RFP out there first. Okay. No, that's definitely fair and also great feedback um, for us to hear that there are organizations interested. We are very ready to post the RFP and only have a few tweaks left so we could get that up. We just didn't want to do a disservice to council by not letting you know about these options from Adams County and ULC, but um, we can absolutely move forward with the RFP if that's that's the direction. Well, yeah, I appreciate that, but I just think in you know, the spirit of fairness, you gotta open it up to everybody and see what everyone's proposing and then you know, once we know who's interested, then we can make an informed decision on you know what's best because um, these are great proposals, but by not opening it up to other organizations, it's just not fair to those organizations that are all, are also interested. Understood, sir. And I think the other component of this is: Does council want to put the RFP out with a preferred lease structure, or do you just want us to put feelers out to see what we get back? Um, that's another reason why we came forward. We, I felt that the past direction maybe wasn't as specific as we wanted it to be. We just want to make sure we achieve your, your goal. Yeah, and I think, you know, the second part of that is, um, you know, we kind of entered this knowing that it wasn't a financial um, reason that we were opening this, but for the services that it would bring the, the city. So, we know that we might not break even, and that, that's fine because the services that come into the city are worth far more than, you know, had the city invested to create these services on their own. So, sure. so for me, you know, I prefer to put something, you know, if it's a dollar per square foot or whatever um, we decide on, but just make it equal for everyone. So when everyone puts in their proposal, um, you know, everyone's playing by the, the same set of rules. Great feedback, thank you. Council Member Noble. Um, I endorse what uh, Council Member Madera is saying here. I've heard from organizations as well, and some of them uh, were also interested in having some of the city services over there in the building that would be complimentary, such as um, you know, CBDG, where people could find out about home repair and painting and all of that kind of stuff that, uh, that would be possible as well. I uh, certainly agree that my understanding from all the conversation around this space was that it was going to be for community organizations in um, Commerce City and to have them be complementary to the ones in the building would be would be excellent. I believe that the offer from Adams County leaves a shortfall as it is of about $7,500, if my calculations are right. Um, 
I think they're offering around 10,000 a month, a dollar a square foot. It's a 10 or 11,000 square foot space, right? Yes, 10,000. Okay, so 2,500 times seven is 17,500. So they're already coming in um, below. So it would be a shortfall of 7,500. So certainly we can um, think about the same thing as the council member was noting of say just a dollar a square foot and figure it out from there. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Councilmember Hurst. Yeah, I, I agree with the with both council members that just spoke. I think the other perspective an RFP can give us is I think in the discussion that led us to the purchase of the fifth floor and all that came after that, I think um, it'd be good for us to hear these proposals because we can identify other needs in the in the community for us to um, consider addressing. Uh, there was other opportunities, not always, not always ones that we agreed to move forward on, but that, that leads me to believe there'll be more opportunities in the future for us to um, look to help to place services in the correct locations. And so I think this is a, a good to hear what's, what's out there, needing the space, um, looking to expand, looking for a better location. I think it's good at the very least to learn that additionally to, to whatever direction we go in. Um, one other thing, the uh, sixth floor at the building is, is vacant, by the way. No one's in there. Any other questions, comments? Do you have what you need? All right. Thank you very much, both of you, for your presentation. We'll move on to the 2021 work plan quarter four update. We'll invite Roger Tinklenberg, city manager, to introduce the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just real briefly, you know, the work plan is based off of the city council's uh, five main goals and then the objectives that were discussed with council uh, at the winter retreat. And uh, we'll be doing that again coming up on uh, Friday and Saturday of this week for uh, 2023. So uh, this report is based on 2021 and the goals that were set for 2021 and the objectives. And so uh, both Kathy Blakeman and Jason Rogers will be presenting on both the internal service side and the external service side for the entire organization. Thank you. Trenton, take the show away, please, sir. <clears throat> so Roger kind of talked through the purpose of tonight's presentation. Next slide, please. So goal one, promote a balanced and thriving city economy. Uh, the first uh, target under which of that is location of a choice, uh, primary employer. <clears throat> I'm not gonna speak to the information on the slide, but a couple of just key takeaways from there. Um, overall, we had 22 new project inquiries, 140 year to date, um, as of to the completion of this report. So we saw a steady increase over the span of the year, which we believe we saw uh, a direct correlation in, in new offerings from employment and in retail in, in the community. Uh, probably one of the, the largest ones that we saw, obviously with performance food groups, which retained 168 jobs, but we'll also see a net increase of 145 over the next decade. That's very important to adding our daytime population. As we know, that's critical and key for, uh, for retail. So just kind of large takeaways. Uh, next slide, please. So target 1.2, uh, creating a sense of place. Uh, we were able to implement uh, the retail plan, which saw a, a different level of retail plan activities ranging from uh, the consultation work that we have with our, our resource that uh, you'll be hearing more coming back in, in March timeframe uh, to other nodal ret uh, retail opportunities in the Northern Range, uh, strengthening the activities in support of the, the shop local messaging. Uh, I would say we've had about 14 existing developer calls uh, we saw the opening of a Dollar Tree store at a new location at 60 of Indent, uh, Dexter. And we saw various other new uh, announcements from uh, AutoZone, uh, Mexican uh, Sabora Casero, Mexican Cafe, DGO Mexican Grill, La Mia Chocana, Ice Cream Shop in, in Derby, Wingstop, 
just to name a few. So a lot of activity uh, for our community, uh, particularly uh, coming out of a year uh, with respect to the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, catalyzation within uh, uh, a number of key areas within the city. Obviously, when we think about Derby um, as being one of those key areas, uh, we uh, had put a lot of time and effort into a grant application. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't uh, successful in that competitive state grant, uh, which was obviously designed to help qualified small businesses for various funding improvements. However, that hasn't uh, I'll say dulled our ability and, and thought on how to be able to leverage other resources to continue to provide uh, the necessary support to Derby and its revitalization. Um, we've also were able to work with uh, a, a local university in uh, restoring our murals that you'll find throughout Derby, which I think you know hold a level of significance for the community, both local and broad. Uh, and that's obviously going to be something that will be carried over into this year um, and into the springtime. So very excited about that. Uh, and then obviously with our housing choice vouchers, which is more along, along the lines of our CDBG program, uh, we have helped well over 323 houses over the span of a year. Uh, that number increased uh, by uh, 20 to 30 homes over the previous year. So. Uh, there's a level of confidence that the state has and what we've been able to receive as far as those vouchers for helping our residents. Next slide, please. 1.4, um, we saw a total, some total of 187 various business license applications over the course of the year. Uh, that is not insignificant for a, a growing city like ourselves. Um, with respect to um, not on the screen, but I think just once again, kind of speaking to that growth and development, we saw an average of about 98% completion rate of buildings, building, building inspections within a 24 to 48 hour period. So when somebody picks up that phone, they call, they ask them to come do an inspection. We're usually out there the next day or at the latest the following day after that and are doing that at a high clip rate. Um, well, over the year, we did over just in total number of building inspections. We did over 29,000 building inspections with a staff of six individuals. Uh, so very high level, uh, level of work. Uh, with respect to uh, Metro Districts, that presentation was made to the Council on 214 as it relates to the reform policy and to the ordinance and the model service plan, which will be brought forward to you all in, in March. So once again, a, a number of different efficiencies and, and effectiveness of the development review process, but also other processes that impact growth and development uh, have been seen over the past year. <clears throat> and with that, I'll turn that over to Kathy. Thank you, sir. Um, so goal number two is promoting an efficient and effective city government to improve levels of service. This mostly encompasses the initiatives of IT and HR and finance. Target 2.1, this has to do with the IT group. They had a lot of projects that they worked on within this past year that they were able to get accomplished and actually be on track. They have several upgrades that are going on right now. One is with uh, New World and NeoGov integration, and that is so that when we do new hires, the um, paperwork and the integration of data back and forth between those two systems runs much more smoothly, which hopefully reduces all levels of, of um, error since the systems speak back and forth. And then PD technology improvements that were started on track, you can see the list of them there. Uh, some of the completed projects in Q4 was the council workroom, the CMO and the CD conference rooms. A lot of the IT strategies that were uh, completed last year, some of them had to go uh, also within a delay into 2022, so they may, the ones that were not completed had to go into 2022. A lot of those had to do with supply chain disruptions. We did have some employee turnover, but mostly vendor delays and uh, some change of scope of work. And all those factors are being monitored and managed as appropriate by the IT department, depending on the uniqueness of each scenario. Next slide. Target 2.2 is a high functioning city workforce. The hybrid work schedule will continue within the city 
and uh, right now employee policies are all being updated. We are in final uh, version of that, that particular project, working with an outside organization to make sure that we are uh, current with the policies that we are, that we are um, proposing. And then there's a citywide internship program that was developed. We've worked with the high schools and we do have some interns, interns that will be starting in spring of 2022. And we did talk a little bit about the NeoGov on, uh, project being on board, for onboarding being on track, but we also updated the employee orientation and that's going to be including some videos uh, from uh, directors and uh, various events that are going on within the city as a part of the new hire orientation to let people know the kind of organization that they will be joining, some of the things that we work on. The vacancy rate for um, the city overall has been relatively good. Um, we've not, we have not had a lot of positions that have remained open for very long. We have very much shortened the time that it takes to get people on board just with improvements within the um, process. And our retention rate is actually doing relatively well right now too. Um, we've got about a 97% retention rate within Q4, which is, um, which is very good. And a lot of employees are participating in that Kazoo Employee Recognition Program. That's where one employee can recognize another employee for something really cool they might have done uh, to assist them with a project. And we've got about an 89% uh, rate of employees that have participated within uh, this past year. Target 2.3, provide responsive action to council identified priorities. This one, we just update for you every single quarter. We do keep track of all this information on Microsoft Planner. And in 2021, there were a total of 346 items that we responded to. A few of those are still uh, open. But the main action items were parking weeds, speed, uh, studies, dumping, and road repairs, and homeless camps. Those were the majority of them. Target 2.4, act in a transparent and accountable manner. Increasing information to the public in both English and in Spanish. We had 12 press releases, 53 news items, and then three community workshops where we had live Spanish interpretation. Our CORA requests for the quarter was 123, but we had 498 for the year. And target 2.5. The, um, bu the uh, budget was published at the end of December after council approved it earlier within December of 21. And the finance department was able to reduce delinquent tax accounts by a whopping 82.6%. We started the year with 707 and ended the year with 123. And that was uh, strictly from uh, either contacts or uh, just people uh, submitting in. But they uh, would do educational for any contact as it pertained to the delinquent tax accounts. They handled that on an educational basis. Pass back to you, sir. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so target 3.1, we can jump through the goal, uh, develop an educational infrastructure. Um, at the finalization of the report, staff has engaged with Adams 14 on a number of different opportunities to help increase uh, educational opportunities, one at Mahai Greyhound Park as it relates to a multicultural building. Uh, various terms, conditions for consideration by the school district have been sent. We're waiting a, a response on that. And uh, just as a general note, that facility would be looked at as an advanced degree program that would provide opportunities both, um, I'll say, our student body, but also our, our adult student body as well for, uh, once again, creating some life skill opportunities. Uh, we've also engaged them in another opportunity of thinking about Innovation Center uh, within our Victory Crossing opportunity. Uh, and once again, waiting to hear back more information from them. But I would say generally there has been um, some level of excitement and an open-mindedness on their part of wanting to continue those conversations moving forward. And we'll do so on our part. Uh, target 3.2, please. Um, as it relates to improving uh, the physical infrastructure as it relates to Derby, solar lighting, uh, obviously with some various staffing challenges. Uh, under, undergrounding of that existing overhead, we're anticipating to occur in mid to late 2022, and that's with respect to XL Energy. <coughs> uh, we've met and we'll continue to keep meeting with XL Energy to determine what that cost of the 
uh, undergrounding overhead electrical lines will be and bring that conversation to the, uh, to the city council at an appropriate time. Uh, with respect to South Adams County Water and Sand, we continue to have our quarterly meetings with them and their various leadership. Um, but I would say we have a very open and a routine conversation with their, their staff uh, to discuss various matters of interest. Um, and we've seen actual various gains from those conversations as it relates to either infrastructure, review of development, uh, and other pressing matters to the city. Next slide, please. Engineering a safe and built environment, um, in addition to those projects that you see on the slide from 112th Avenue bridge construction down to the RFP for the HSIP grant, and then more particularly for the, for the grant, uh, those that is looking at improvements for 96 in Tower, 120th in Chambers, 72nd in Locust, as well as other upgrades uh, to help signal, you know, to the signal ahead and higher visibility black plates advertised that we have that we will be advertised, excuse me, in Q1 of this year. Uh, on another note, uh, we will also be entering into an IGA uh, with respect to that grant uh, with C with CDOT and that the RFP with CDOT uh, for safer Main Street grants at Colorado Boulevard between 68th and 70th will also be advertised in Q1 of this year. So a number of different um, activities that we are looking at from our horizontal infrastructure and trying to either uh, ensure that we're meeting basic general welfare safety standards and or trying to hit that golden standard with uh, just the quality of life for our, our, our community. Next slide, please. 3.4, uh, as it relates to all phases of our CIPP are, being, are on time, on budget, and to the prescribed standard, uh, you all receive a monthly report um, from myself as it relates to where we stand with those projects of interest or what we believe to be projects of interest from the council but also from the community. Uh, in and of that, to further our efficiency and our effectiveness, uh, we have had staff attend the Project Management Institute. Uh, their training is complete and we intend to have staff come back and to be able to share that broad base with not just within public works but also within the broader organization. Uh, so that we can start to see how we can leverage that uh, time savings and once again, additional resources. <clears throat> Goal number four, uh, 4.1, uh, create an aesthetically pleasing neighborhood. Uh, the police department has spent a better part of this quarter training on uh, the ordinance with respect to the oversized parking. Uh, is working with community relations on providing information as it pertains to that new ordinance and then enforcing that ordinance shortly thereafter. Um, uh, it is worth saying that there are, there's continued to be an inability to tow large vehicles um, as we've continued to see a, a lack of uh, space for dead storage uh, from our, con our contractor and other various space availability that they can be able to provide. Uh, I do know and I am aware that PD is looking for solutions to address that, uh, but that is continuing to be um, a, an issue that we are having to navigate. Uh, that's the unfortunate reality. Um, we are seeing, uh, I'll say, uh, good response with our minor home repair. Uh, in Q4, we saw 13 participants, and I would say over the year we had 27 uh, participants within that program that obviously requires access to home and other, uh, I'll say, close interactions with individuals and during a pandemic. Uh, that's actually an uptick in what we had in uh, 2020. So that's a positive sight to see. Uh, with respect to code enforcement, uh, we saw both proactive and, and reactive code enforcement. We had, uh, I'll say, a completion rate of 86% on average over the entire year, and we saw almost 3,300 in total voluntary code compliance cases, uh, which is once again another increase over 2020 to 2021. Next slide, please. Uh, with respect to PRG, I think what's critical to note here actually on this slide is that um, through the entire year, uh, with respect to having to adjust either to uh, various 
health orders or issues as it may relate just to trying to run uh, various recreational programs or uh, events at the, at the golf course, um, PRG was able to maintain 100% normal operations. And within that, they were able to design and define four successful um, programs and what you find with the dance recital, Serial Fasanda, Fall Fest, and the run with Buffalo, we on average saw well over 100 plus participants at each event. And I think uh, the, the city doing its part as it, re as it relates to the COVID pandemic um, allowed for the rec centers during this 100% of normal operations to also operate as vaccine clinics and providing over 660 vaccines over the course of the year. I think one other thing to, to, to share, or a couple of other things to share just from a, from a, from a numeric standpoint, uh, Bison Ridge in just Q4 made almost 170,000 in, in revenue from just the activity that it saw. Uh, we saw almost 30,000 plus admissions to Bison Ridge um, in Q4 alone, and well over 117,000 uh, across the entire year as far as admissions to that facility. And we saw at Eagle Point year to date, uh, almost uh, well over 74,000 uh, just at that recreation facility. So very high usage at our facilities and to be able to maintain that 100% normal operations is not insignificant to say the least. <clears throat> uh, target 4.3, please. Uh, with safeguarding resident health and well-being, uh, obviously, you'll find a, a, a number of provisions that were made as it relates to environmental health from our quality air quality meetings, uh, providing you with a draft air quality monitoring plan, a, looking at a final community-wide impact report, uh, drafting impact report that was provided to council in October of last year. Um, there has been quarterly water quality updates uh, just with Public Works drafting LID, low impact uh, design techniques for infrastructure going forward that will greatly import, uh, benefit private development, also but public improvements and public projects as they go forward. Um, we are continuing to work and there will be a presentation in the coming months on the Keep Commerce City Clean. I know that's no longer the name, but it's the one that we have referenced in the report, but it's my C3 uh, with where we stand. What I can share with you and what will be presented to you is a, uh, at the time is a, we do have a logo and a tagline completed. Website, the website design is in its final stages of review. And uh, PR, P, Public Works with PRG and other departments that are providing support uh, is working very closely with community relations on a communications plan to be able to look at the development and the review at the implementation of that. And we intend to bring that to council uh, for your conversation as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. With target 4.4, I think one of the biggest things that I want to be able to call out is that with the you know, University of North Dakota, uh, Commerce City PD has uh, compiled data on over 180 uh, recent domestic violence incidents, and that data has been shared with the University of North Dakota uh, which has agreed to conduct research on those various aspects of that data. Uh, and among those aspects, uh, they agree to look at various spatial and temporal aspects uh, with respect uh, to those specifics within the city. Um, we are awaiting that report. And once we have that report and have been able to review that, uh, a determination will be made where we can bring that information forward for council's consumption discussion as it relates to that effort. But as it currently stands, we have not received it as of yet. And a target 4.5, uh, we have seen priority zero and one call response time up from 9.6 minutes to 10.7. <clears throat> and I will turn it back over to Kathy for goal five. Okay, goal five, improving community involvement and trust. Target 5.1 is increasing civic pride. There were six community events in Q4 with about 1,900 attendees, and that was uh, Fall Fest, Nine Health Fair, Run with a Buffalo, a Wine and Paint, Cereal with Santa, and 
uh, Halloween scavenger hunt. And we're continuing to work on refining the uh, art consultant RFP scope, which will be going out in Q1 of 2022. Next slide. Improving citizen interaction. There were Facebook pages that reached 30, th over 30,000 um, people with over 126,000 engagements. And the website received over 233,000 views. Our own city homepage had 19,876 homepage views and uh, 12,621 unique park and recreation um, views. If you included Twitter and Nextdoor, we had 469,000 social media impressions, and that was in Q4 of 2021. And an impression is a reaction, a comment, a shared post, a link click, that sort of thing. Next slide. We uh, had a contract with um, Meet the Challenge, and they actually did a, um, um, an analysis of our ADA requirements and we're looking at a contract extension uh, possibly with them as we move forward on starting to implement some of those responses to, um, to the final report that they had. With the DEI Commission, uh, they meet on Wednesday, uh, the last Wednesday night of the month, and this last quarter they collaborated in discussions with the Historical Society, they, and then they also spoke with them again this year already, uh, they added, the DEI added priorities to the city council's legislative priorities and <clears throat> also drafted and scheduled proclamations to ensure that we had timely recognitions um, of proclamations. Um, we had 19 city meetings with an average of two Spanish speaking participants at each one of those meetings and there are ongoing efforts to increase the Spanish language distribution of all city publications. And next slide please, 5.4. There were 21 videos that were published in Q4 in both English and in Spanish and the YouTube channel had over 19,000 views and city council will return to in-person meetings in December and the hybrid and virtual attendance option is still available to the public. Um, Trenton is taking over for now the Civics Academy, and we'll be taking a look at uh, that now that we're beginning to get to in-person events again. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you all three of you for that presentation. Does anybody on council have any questions? Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. And thanks for presentation tonight. I was just curious, um, on slide 10, what are some of the internship programs? I was just curious what they are. They're gonna be starting within the HR department, so they're going to um, kind of um, guinea pig, I guess, the, the process, and they'll look for various sorts of, of projects that could be done that are not gonna be too highly into, you know, obviously, uh, confidential information, so they may have an opportunity to help develop a certain policy, for example, or they'll be attending various meetings and be able to participate within, for example, the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So um, that's that's uh, still going to be determined specifically depending on the candidates coming in, but we do have a variety of options like that. Oh, okay. So candidates still are coming in. Because do you know how many students have applied so far? I don't know how many have applied, but I think we're bringing in three, mm. I believe, is where we ended up. Okay. And then is, was it selected from both districts? One of the districts declined to participate at this time, so we'll be grabbing them in the future. Okay. Which district is that that declined? Don't recall which one. Okay. Just so I know, can you let me know? I'm just curious you, which you one declined. Yep. Yeah, thank you. And then, um, let's see. The, let's see. Yeah, that, that's all I had. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Noble. Thank you. I had a few questions. When you name primary employers, uh, who is who's considered a primary employer? What's the definition? <clears throat> so a primary employment in in the industry sense is a 
industry that is manufacturing a good uh, and is then exporting it um, out for others' consumption. Whereas a secondary employer, employer it, you would find in the typical sense, would be a, a, a distribution warehousing uh, facility because once again, it's not manufacturing, it's just serving as a, uh, a, a transmission point within the operation. So we have, I don't have the exact list of primary employers and, and or inquiries that we have, but we have seen some of that from our industrial perspective see a, a benefit here. We have large employers that we've been able to make announcements of, such as your performance food groups, your Amazon, your Lowe's, uh, that are much more along the lines of your supply chain and your distribution um, that we've seen an increase in an uptick in. Yeah. Um, yeah, wouldn't those be secondary employees, employers who just named yes, those, those would be secondary as under the industry primary. sense. Yes, they would be secondary. Right. Um, they are of note, I would say, uh, just from a perception perspective, and it's a good perception is that we're able to attract those more well-named um, employers that you know fall within the top 100 of your Forbes 500 list, um, because then obviously they're going to want to have some of those associated amenities. To be able to support their employees, so it's a good it's a good stepping point for us in in what we're seeing with being able to get that level of employer to the city. Yeah, and I would like to see uh, employers with sustainable salaries, so that the folks they're hiring can actually afford the homes in Commerce City. Um, lot of warehouses in the north, but the homes are way above. You know. If you're making twenty dollars an hour in a warehouse, it's going to be impossible to to afford the homes in that area. And I'm concerned that we're not attracting enough sustainable employment for our residents. Um, let's see. Uh, it, regarding um, community involvement, I have really been thinking about this a lot ever since. We had the uh, comprehensive plan presentation. I was disappointed at the time, but I think I've become even more disappointed that there seemed to be a heavy business and industry influence and uh, not much community. And considering uh, we're paying these um, consultants $700,000, the lack of community involvement is um, is, uh, I mean, I can't even think of a word for it. They're getting $700,000 to do this. They can figure out a way to get to our residents, I think, and get them involved. The vision statement was pretty heavy business industry, in my opinion. Um, under promoting residents' health, safety, and education, I think that the, uh, a lot was done in terms of uh, reaching out and, and uh, testifying to air and water agencies as well um, about regulations. So it's, it's public health as much as anything as well. And um, specifically, what's happening about the Family Senior Navigator? Has that actually been posted? That position has not been posted as of yet. Um, we are working through some internal details and make sure that we have uh, the job description in a position that we're, a, we're able to successfully recruit for the right individual, not just an individual in that role, because that role will be, to better put it, uh, will be specialized in having to address a, a multitude of, of different items within, within the community. Yeah. So um, I'd rather have the right butt in the chair as opposed to just having a butt in the chair that ultimately we have to move on from. So we're, we're taking the due diligence necessary to make sure that we're getting the right individual with the values and, and the core beliefs of what we're trying to accomplish with, with that position. And with, quite frankly, what, uh, what we have heard from our council when we were looking at the creation of that position during the uh, 2022 budget process. So it is budgeted? That is correct. Okay. Good, because I know the senior commission is anxious to have the role filled. And 
you know, nonprofit folks with nonprofit backgrounds that would be perfect for that. Um, about the metro district stuff that we have been talking about previously, that and you noted in the presentation, mm -hmm. I am concerned that the metro district proposal does all of it assumes approval of a metro district. And the standard that other cities are going by now is that the developer must demonstrate what it is doing in a positive fashion for the community mm -hmm. before they even qualify for a metro district. Because a metro district actually makes them scads of money. You know, we know that. So there has to be something, some quid pro quo. Um, there is um, a group called Ellers, which is really well known among other municipalities. It has been working on uh, metro districts, worked very closely with um, Fort Collins on the revision of their metro district uh, regulations, which were already far stronger than Commerce City's even two years ago. So um, I think that that's a big missing component in our, in our, um, in our metro district information. There's no pro forma. There can be a pro forma, for example. Um, we can set standards that they must meet in order to qualify for a metro district in Commerce City. And we need, I think we need the staff to be looking at that as well or bring Ellers in as a consultant on the metro districts to have another look at this because um, that's a component that is very necessary in my mind. Um, and then regarding improving community involvement and trust, I think the fourth quarter was actually pretty difficult for Commerce City. And um, there were a lot of questions from residents. We showed certain weaknesses during that quarter. And I think it's something that um, we also need to be fair when we do these reports and also express where we can learn from the experience as well. Um, and that happened to be one that we could learn from and it's an ongoing issue. It hasn't been resolved yet, so we still have an opportunity to do it well and answer questions for, um, that residents have in their minds. And um, you know that gets to other issues that have come up lately also about planning and that sort of thing as well. So those are all um, extremely important as well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, appreciate all of those comments. Just with respect to, to Metro District, um, I think obviously one of the things that we've built into the policy and the process is an informal review um, very early on to the, the application. Um, and then once again, being able to determine whether or not there is a, a net positive or not. Now, if that's not as uh, concrete as council would like to see, and I think as the points that you've raised, I think staff, we're, we're more than willing to go out and to conduct any additional due diligence if, if that is the, the will of the body. If, if council wants us to go out and to look at elders, if council wants us to look at something of a gatekeeping mechanism that's a little bit more, like I said, um, concrete, standardized, and or introspective, more than willing to do that. I, I do have to say, that while doing that, um, it also delays implementation on what I would consider, uh, I think, a, a good starting point, a good baseline for us to get in place, to have something in place for those applications that come through our door that at any time council can choose to elect to make changes, whether it's two months, three months, four months, six months, but without implementing a policy a model service plan, an ordinance, um, the conversations we continue to have around the tables are not going to have the teeth behind them because there's, there's nothing in paper for us to rely on. So I think there's possibly, possibly a, a blended approach of with what you received on the 14th, get that in place 
while still asking us to do some due diligent review that we can bring forward in a timely manner so that once again, we're not trying to get everything approved at one time. That could be three, four, five, six months down the road and applications that may want to come in be under review that are not going to be covered or required to be covered under these proposed recommendations. So just something for council to think about as well. I understand your point, but at the same time, we, have it, we don't have anything in the regulations that require a developer to qualify for a metro district in Commerce City. And that's where I have um, questions. And I don't know if it's worthwhile to go forward other than to limit um, mills, for example. And we could do that independent of all the rest of it that's been written. We could just do that de facto. So I don't know, are you bringing, when, what's the date of the vote on the Metro District uh, plan? It's my understanding that we would be bringing the ordinance and the policy and the model service plan, um, and please forgive me, uh, either the first or second meeting in March. For, actually, it's going to be the second meeting in March, given that the first meeting is next week. Um, for first reading and then second reading in, in April. Well, okay, I would understand that, but I also know that when um, someone doesn't want to do something, that it can just get slow walked, and next thing you know, it's a year, two years down the road, which is exactly what happened to this whole metro district stuff. It took two years from the time I came on council in January and until now we're in February two years later. So it's been a long process to get here. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But it is a very important aspect that needs to be dealt with and not later, but sooner. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that, ma'am. And I can, I can affirm and confirm that the staff is not going to slow walk the item before council. Uh, we have a desire. Uh, we've been given direction. And our direction is to bring that forward to council for you all as a body to take appropriate action. And as that stands right now, uh, unless my staff kicks me underneath the virtual table, that's intended to be in March and April timeframe. Thank you. Deputy City Manager Blinkman. Thank you, sir. Um, it was District 14 that had declined and it had to do with um, the principal retiring and them reorganizing, so we're hoping to be able to capture them within fall. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. And we're also gonna bring, bring uh, the three to council next month, so uh, from 27J, so they'll be pretty excited to be here. Yeah, I just had a quick question. <clears throat> um, the continuing to refine our consultant RFP scope of services uh, kind of spurred this. Um, what's going on with the RTD light rail station in that art piece that was approved, like, I think before COVID, if I'm not mistaken? Do you know? They had issues with uh, materials, as I understood it, but uh, they're working on trying to get that resolved. Right. Right. Thank you. Yeah, that's correct. That's the best I know. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, just uh, you know, something that kind of seemed to fall through the cracks because it's not... Yeah. Haven't seen any movement on that. Yeah, if I remember correctly, the artist originally had proposed use of uh, a certain type of plastic, and RTD ruled that out and asked them to go to stainless steel. And so, you know, the artist had to rethink the design of it, basically. So. Okay. Thanks for the, Thanks for the update. Thanks for the jog of memory. Are there any other questions or comments regarding the work plan? Councilmember Hurst. Yeah, one, real quick on that, there was also a lighting issue. It came back to Cultural Council to try to make a decision on lighting. Is it going to be solar because of some of the issues? So I think that was a couple months back at least. So I know they're working on it, but um, some changes, but nothing major. So on the work plan, um, I. I think it is very important for us to address the metro district issues as, as Councilwoman Noble was just talking about. There was some supplemental information that we got in our packet tonight, the finance overview, and this is not, you know, 
it's not directly in any comments tonight, but I do want to make sure that we are calling out kind of why a lot of times we are business minded in a lot of our discussion. And you can see in the taxation that we collected $77.5 million in sales and use tax, or, or of the $77.5 million we collected, 90% of that came from sales and use tax from the businesses, and less than 5% came from uh, property taxes with the residents. And that tax rate came at about $22.19 per 100,000. So a $500,000 house on average brings in like 120 bucks a, a year for the city. And so 100% agree all of our, our uh, the people who live and work in Commerce City, all of their voices need to be heard, but business pays the bills, pays for all the programs that we are able to have at our rec centers. Um, it really does pay for the operation of the city. So. Business and new development, we have to find a way to work on that balance that we're all talking about, but understand that our conversations do leave this room and they can be detrimental to the, the opportunities that are in front of us. And that number hits a square in the, at least me, hits me square in the chin that 90% comes from sales and use tax, which means they're paying use tax on the equipment inside of a, a warehouse. They're paying sales tax on any uh, maintenance issues to maintain their building to, to appropriate quality. All of those things impact our city on a day-to-day -day basis um, and really allow us to have a lot of the conversations that we're talking through right now when it comes to growth, when it comes to providing the infrastructure and the needs of our citizens as we project growth and you know out to 2050. The foundation of where that money's coming from is back with our businesses. And so focusing on that balance is always going to be important to me. That's a lot of where you know, I try to bring the perspective back to at times. It's not because I don't want to hear the voice of our citizens, but a lot of what I hear from our citizens is they want more business. They want more opportunities. And a lot of that takes us almost incentivizing and finding ways to bring the businesses that we want to see, our constituents want to see, into our city, and a lot of times, you know, those are tougher conversations because we obviously all don't want to play favorites as well. And so I think that's where some of our, our conversation needs to shift when we talk about businesses. What do we need to do now as a city to promote, you know, a specialty grocer or something along those lines that we hear about all the time? I know we've dipped our toes into that in this, in, with this group, but now I think as we're working on a comprehensive plan, one of the things I see the opportunity for is unity of message in that comprehensive plan. We want that, that balance to be portrayed perfectly in that because that's the story that the nine of us are now out there tasked to tell, if you will. Um, we're, we're constantly trying to sell this city. I think everybody puts in great effort. Um, so let's, let's continue to work as a team to build that unified message so we have that walking out of this room to say, hey, Commerce City is a different, a different place than, than that perceived place you know, that we see out there, where sometimes uh, incidents happen and they get magnified in Commerce City because of, of our past history or our past, um, you know, the way people view Commerce City. But in reality, we're part of the metro and we're growing. There's so much positive. Let's tell that story. So I just wanted to point out, I thought the financial overview that was provided to us tonight was is really good great kind of executive level overview of what's going on. Um, but it's just one of the things I wanted to highlight is just that 90% number is critical to our success. And so making sure we have that, that balance in, in our mindset as we move forward, you know, development is breeding other development. And sometimes the, the, what comes first that leads to the, to the back end may not be the way we want it to happen, but within our control, we can still keep you know, our goals as well as our constituents' goals um, on the same page by ha having that unified message, that unified story, because there's so much great for us to talk about that's happening in this city. Sometimes I feel like we focus on, for good reason, some of the bad stuff and we don't give enough spotlight to the good stuff. And so I'm just trying to 
interject that, I had some conversations that really felt like I thought we were doing a better job at telling our story. And at least to these two people, it wasn't. It wasn't the greatest job of us telling our story. And I think that we, you know, was given the opportunity to retell our story and didn't, didn't change any of the facts and people heard something that they were very surprised by. And I think that's a, a good thing for us because we have a lot of opportunity to change people's perspective on our city and, and really deliver on some of the goals that we all have. Sorry for the rant, I just hit me, hit me, hit me right on the 90%. I just wanted to follow up on uh, what you said, Councilmember Hurst, about the 90%. And uh, one of the questions that I've raised a couple of times is what is the city's cost per home? So if we know we're only getting maybe $120 for a $500,000 home, how much does it cost the city for that home to exist? And that is a number that other cities have, have determined, um, over 2,000 in, in some communities. So I really would like to know what that, what that number is because at a certain point, we may be talking about, you know, can, can we afford um, the residential explosion if we can't keep up financially? So th that's a great question, and it's one that I say I today can't answer to the exact cent, but it is something that we have asked as part of our user and impact fee study, because you've got to be able to understand where you're at to be able to know where you're going and what you're trying to address and to make sure that we have a good growth sustainability model for the city, not just five years, but 45 years into the future. So we are looking at that. And obviously that will be a part of your packet of information as we go through that process of determining where we need to set that, um, for the lack of a better price point as it relates to the fees so that we strike that balance of continuing to incentivize various employment, supportive amenities from a commercial perspective, but also that we are still getting the housing market that helps to attract those end users that want to be able to uh, have the, the rooftops proffer them uh, from a 16 hour day perspective. So uh, that is going to be forthcoming. Once again, we've kicked that off with our uh, financial consultant, Will Dan, Will, Dan, Will Dan Financial Services, who is partnering with us on the uh, impact fee and, and user fee uh, study. So. Uh, that began at the end of December, beginning of January. Um, they are going through various data that they've collected from all departments, both internal and external, so that they can distill down to, I'll say, key themes and key information that they, w they believe will be of interest to the council to help make certain decisions along the way as it relates to a cost recovery philosophy, because what you're also speaking about to a certain extent is what is our cost recovery? as it relates to various aspects within our community. City services. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, Kathy, I just wanted to ask some, um, can you make sure yourself or city staff um, reaches out to someone at Adams 14 again, just to make sure, because I don't think it's fair, you know, that if they don't have a principal that they're not given an, the same opportunity to try to be, a, you know, give a ch participate in the internship as well. So can you just make sure and reach out and give them the opportunity as well? Sure, they do have the opportunity. They they could, but they they declined. So, okay, but I thought you said it was because of, at the present yeah, they, time. they said it's because they were reorganizing uh -huh. and that they because the principal had left, not us. Uh -huh. We we'd have it. That's what I'm to saying. Them. But how long ago was that when they declined? Oh, I think we reached out in about the December time, December -ish time. So frame. I'm just saying, can you make sure before it's you official bet. that they are given another opportunity to see if anything's changed? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thank Thanks. Any other questions or comments, Mr. Mayor? I do believe Council Member Dudless had had a question. I think she put her hand down. 
I did actually. I've raised it a couple of times. And thank you so much for acknowledging me. Um, sorry that uh, um, I'm not there tonight, and I really, really wish that I would have been able to uh, join you. But um, yeah, just commenting on you know the 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 citizens not having as much as a say in what's going on in the city, it's especially as far as the 1% sales tax, it's just not businesses who pay that. I mean, it's the people who live here as well. We have to consider that. I mean, every time they buy, somebody buys a car or anything like that, they, they get charged that 1% sales tax. So those people, our citizens contribute to that. Um, I also wanted to bring up something about the metro districts, and it, it goes back to the um, uh, improvement on 120th. So the metro district is putting in $4 million, but from what I understand, the that metro district, uh, they decided to refinance. And so ultimately, I feel like once again, the citizens are gonna be paying for that improvement because I'm sure that's probably where that 4 million came from. And that's another thing that we should look at with these Metro districts is how often they refinance because when they refinance, no one is looking at what they're doing with the money and, and <laughs> how it's distributed and who's, who's getting that. But ultimately it is the citizens who are responsible for repayment of that, that money. And uh, I, I think there just needs to be much more oversight on, on the metro districts and, and uh, things like that just catch my attention. And, and I, I do know that there were complaints about the fact that, that they were gonna go ahead and, and refinance. And I hear that about metro districts all the time. So, I would like to see some kind of oversight on, on when they refinance and where the money goes when they refinance, as far as the, as far as the Metro districts are concerned. So thank you for acknowledging me, I appreciate it. Thank you, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we thank you all for that presentation. We'll move on to the discussion on refunding the 2K bonds. We'd like to invite Roger Tinklenberg, city manager, to introduce the presentation. So the reason we're bringing this to you is because the interest rate is much lower than it was when the bonds were originally issued. Um, so the interest rate has been climbing in recent uh, weeks. Uh, when I initially talked to you, I talked about uh, $19 million of savings over the life, remaining life of the bonds, uh, which had a net present value of, of between 13 and $14 million. That has slipped. Uh, we're now looking at $17 million in total savings over the remaining life of the bonds. Uh, net present value is uh, 12.7 as of Friday, so $12.7 million of savings. What that means is uh, we're able to reduce the, the debt service payments that we have to make each year. Um, but what I also talked to council about and put in the, the memo that I sent to you on Friday, which you know was a very simple overview, uh, we have remaining authorization with the uh, bonds that were authorized by the voters, uh, and that remaining authorization is about $38 million. Uh, because of reserve requirements, that type of thing, we can issue about $35 million of additional bonds, which would allow council to select projects to build, whether that be road improvement projects or parks, trails, recreation type of projects. The voter authorization was for parks, recreation, and road improvements. So we're limited to those three areas. We cannot build a police substation. We cannot you know, do a number of things with that money. It has to be one of those three areas. 
there are a ton of park projects. There are 20 tons of, of road projects, speaking metaphorically. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of projects, and, and it's entirely up to council if we issue that additional $35 million worth of bonds to take care of additional projects. In the presentation for tonight, we included additional projects for your consideration. That certainly is not an exhaustive list. Those are, that's a list of what's hanging out there right now. So again, it's, it's up to council whether we, uh, number one, refinance the existing bonds, and the purpose for doing that would be to lower the interest rate, reduce our debt service. It's just like refinancing your house at a lower interest rate. Um, second issue, for your decision is whether we issue the additional 35 million worth of bonds. So those are the quick, quick, dirty overview, and I'll turn it over to Cheryl Carsons. Thank you, Roger, I appreciate that. Give me a second here to get the presentation. This does not like me tonight. Thank goodness Dylan is here. Sorry about that, thanks Dylan. Um, so Roger touched on the majority of the highlights, but I will um, go over a few more things. I did want to mention that um, to my left, Dalton Kelly has joined us. He is here from Butler Snow. They serve as our bond council online. Kim Crawford, who is also from Butler Snow, is available for questions. Um, Jason Simmons, who serves as our financial advisor from Hilltop Securities, is on the line, and David Bell with RBC Capital Markets, who would serve as our placement agent for this particular offering, is on the line to answer questions as well. So this shows you just a recap of where we're at right now and how we got here. Um, if you'll remember, the voters authorized a total of $166 million in debt. That was to be used to finance certain park, recreation, and road improvement, along with the operations and maintenance for those amenities. The first issue of debt was issued June 5th of 2014 in the amount of $73.4 million. The debt service payment on that series for 2022 is $4.5 million. The second issue, or tranche, was issued on September 20th, 2016 for $54.4 million. The debt service payment on that series for 2022 is 3.3 million. Um, so the total 2K debt that has been issued so far, principal amount is 127.9 million. The combined 2022 debt service payment is 7.8 million. And there's roughly 38 million left in remaining authorization that could be issued. Um, this just provides some of the details about the first issuance for 2014. If nothing happens, um, that debt would retire in August of 2024. There would be an optional redemption opportunity in August of 2024, and the payoff amount would be $60 million plus interest or could potentially just refund that debt. Um, the pledged revenue for this issuance is the 1% sales and use tax, but there is also a subordinate lien against the 3.5% sales and use tax in the event the 1% would not be able to cover that debt service payment. The series 2016 issue um, has a retirement date of August 2046 with an optional redemption date in 2026. Um, same pledged revenue, the 1% sales and use tax and subordinate lien of 3.5% sales and use tax in the event that the 1% could not cover that debt service payment. 
So I know that Roger has had an opportunity to speak with all of you, but the um, offering that is before us is working with City National Bank. They're a wholly um, owned subsidiary of RBC. Um, they initially, um, David Bell from RBC Capital Markets brought this item to us for consideration and discussion. And originally it was to potentially just do a refunding of the existing debt to provide some debt service annual savings. Um, as we had those conversations, we did talk to him about the opportunity to potentially not only refund that debt, but possibly do the additional authorization to provide um, funding for capital projects going forward. Um, this is referred to as a, t a Cinderella bond. Um, it's because the refundings would initially be at a taxable rate, but then converts 90 days prior to the respectable call dates to tax exempt, which is what we have traditionally been participating in. Um, this is a little information about the purchaser. Thought that you would like to see that information. They have over 97 billion of assets, largest Southern California based commercial bank. Um, they have significant experience in this sector and um, a 1 billion tax exempt portfolio. And they work closely to fashion these types of deals. Um, refunding options before us are to do the advance refunding as taxable and realize those savings. We could do nothing and wait for the call dates on these series 2K bonds as they stand, but with a Cinderella structure, it will combine those options and allow us to do an advanced refunding that starts as taxable and converts to tax exempt. We're recommending that we go with a third option of doing the taxable and the conversion, but also which results, um, Roger mentioned that this dollar amount has changed based on the updated numbers that were provided to us last Friday, but it is still close to that $13 million amount. The use of money options, we could simply save the save on those debt service payments, which means the revenue generated from that 1% um, would exceed the expenditures, so therefore our 2K fund balance would increase annually. We could dedicate the debt service savings to a particular use and use that as a pay-as-you-go on projects that fall within that threshold. Or in addition to the refunding, we could issue all or a portion of the remaining debt that was previously authorized by the voters. Our recommendation is that we go with option C. As Roger mentioned, staff worked with him to provide um, a variety of projects for your um, review and consideration. Ultimately, City Council will make the decision about which projects would be covered with any new issuance. Keep in mind that the original debt authorized only use for parks, recreation, road improvements, and O&M. These projects offered fall within those categories. The estimated costs listed would certainly need to be updated if these projects were selected. Staff would need to work on um, truing up these numbers, and that could be at the time of approval of those. So there um, were four slides with a variety of different projects, some smaller amounts to larger amounts. The, the total projects certainly exceed the amount of additional authorization we could issue. So um, some combinations were put together for your consideration um, that roughly come to that amount that we could issue the additional debt. The next steps for this would be if council gives staff the direction, we would be bringing a bond ordinance to you for consideration at the March 7th meeting. That would be presented as emergency ordinance so that we could, um, that bond, that ordinance would be effective immediately with a vote of seven. And that would allow us to lock in the rate. Um, it allows, you know, since the market is continuing to change, it would amount, allow us to do that sooner and um, start the referendum period. In the packet, Rod, or not the packet, I apologize, Roger in the memo, in his email provided a memo that was drafted by um, Kim Crawford and Dalton Kelly from Butler Snow that outlined the documents that you would need to consider, which included the bond ordinance and the covenant agreement. Those are not in their final form, but fairly close to. 
Um, at this point, I am happy to answer questions or the several people that are on the line or in the room are happy to answer questions or if you would like to speak specifically about the bond ordinance or continuing um, the covenant agreement that was included, um, we're willing to answer those questions as well. Thank you, ma'am, appreciate that. Does anybody on council have any questions? Council Member Noble. Thank you very much. I'm actually not clear on the other 35 or 38 million that you were discussing. Is that an additional amount of money that would be come part of the bond and so it would wipe out the savings? I'm unclear. Um, it, it doesn't wipe out the savings, um, but it would be an additional debt service payment on that portion. Um, because the voters authorized 166 million and we have not um, issued all of that, that is how we come up with that amount to be able to get those additional proceeds to be used for additional capital projects. But our bond, our total debt service payment would go up. The amount that that would go up is lower because of the savings that would be realized on the refunding portions of the existing debt. Well, at my house, if we can refinance and put in the master bathroom that I've been wanting, <laughs> you know, then I figured that's a win-win. It didn't work out that way, but we did refinance. So if you can refinance here and then do more projects for Commerce City, I think that's, that's really the, uh, a great route. And one of the things I failed to mention, but Roger did include in his memo to you, is that um, each year finance does the analysis of the 2K fund balance, and we provide that information to you as part of the budget process. Um, each year fund balance has continued to go up. Um, on average, it has gone up each year around $4 million. So if we take that additional $1.25 million for the new $35 million in debt, we still would be adding to 2K fund balance unless something you know, happened at some point with that 1% revenue and we started to see a decline, but I don't see an indication of that. Council Member Douglas. Yes, thank you. Uh, so like when you refinance your house, when you have a 30 year loan, when you refinance, um, if you don't choose to uh, go with um, a, like a 15 year loan, um, then you, your 30 years starts over. Is that the case with this as well? The uh, existing bonds that, that we would refinance would still have the same ending term date. Okay. The new bonds would be on a 30 year, so those would be later. Oh, so that it would be long, a longer period of time then? Just for the new bonds for the additional 35 million? Oh, for the additional 35 million. Right. Okay, just wanted to be clear on that. All right, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Council Member Hurst? Should have waited to go after Councilman Madera. Um, but, you know, I hate to even say this, but it almost is a market opportunity, and I hate to call this market an opportunity, but I, I just think the dollars will be more valuable today than they will be in next year, even. Um, even with 13% increase in construction costs kind of across the board in what we're talking about, like road projects and everything else, I still think it'll be, we're not going to see a slowdown on on uh, inflation immediately. And so I think the money today is going to be worth more now than it will be. And so with that 35 million, I think we have to prioritize really impactful projects, but it makes sense to me from from a situation that we're in, kind of holistic situation of the market right now, it makes sense to do it now and um, do our best to get it right on how we prioritize what we spend that on. Yeah, I think Councilman Hurst pretty much uh, took the words out of my mouth, you know, with uh, just the way things are going on the market, the inflation we've seen over the, the past year of 6%. 
rates are only going to go up to try to stabilize that and you know the just events that are happening in our world right now that are only going to drive that further so you know the quicker that we can close this and take advantage of the rates that we have now um, the better off that we'll be any other questions or comments councilmember douglas I didn't know that if my hand wasn't lowered, but um, since uh, um, I still have it up, so like the the people in Buffalo Highlands are missing a part. Would you be able to consider looking at something like that to compensate them? It's a decision council will make in terms of what priority projects you select. So uh, people in Bi Buffalo Highlands, no, they don't get to make that decision. The city council makes that decision. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. I guess we'll be voting on that on uh, next Monday. Last up is a town hall logistics discussion. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I, I thought it was prudent to kind of come back before council uh, with respect to following up on the conversation at the 14th meeting when we talked about uh, the the concept of a town hall and, and joint collaboration with uh, Oakwood Homes. And uh, the goal of really the conversation tonight is to make sure that we are hitting council's expectations on the desired outcome for that meeting. Uh, and, in, in, and in particular, you know, the discussion items to, to be held with the community, whether it's the extension of the existing CDA, um, focusing on the new CDA, uh, conversations in and around what truly, I think, if we're talking about the sports authority and, and, and being frank, right, what level of partnership do we need to create and to have um, with Oakwood Homes as a, and, and, and Clayton as their uh, founding company in order to be able to pull something that complex and significant off for, for our community. Uh, so if that's going to be the case, one, to make sure that I and my team have just some of the basic parameters of the expectations from you all as a body for us to go out and to continuing having conversations with, with Oakwood on the matter. What I can share with you um, that maybe will help frame some of your thought for tonight is where do we currently stand on just some of the basic logistics of time, date, um, our initial thought on approach and whether or not that's acceptable. So date, right now we have Wednesday, April 6th at Bison Ridge Center uh, locked in as our potential town hall. Uh, obviously we're working through uh, the timing in the evening in which we would hold that, but we're looking at a two hour period window in being able to be available for uh, that conversation with our, our community. The general thinking that we have on the approach is obviously for us as staff taking a much more fact-based approach, putting the information as it relates to the city's role, the developer's role, as it may pertain from uh, the onset of the Buffalo Hills Ranch PUD, which is reunion, uh, starting with Shea, all the way through to present day with Oakwood and their role as they have and we have participated on a number of different items um, over the course of the history. Uh, we'd have a general open house kind of boards out there that has information available uh, for the community to be able to digest uh, a potential brief presentation with residents, given not knowing how many that we're gonna have in participation, uh, being able to provide their comments in writing so that we can read those out and then be able to respond so that we're getting everybody and being uh, uh, due deferent to individuals and making sure that we're hearing every voice, not just a, a singular voice or a small handful. So we wanna make sure that we're giving everybody a chance to be able to have their comments be heard, be read, and or be able to be followed up on. Um, 
that's kind of the general sense of where we're at. We know that there's more conversations that need to be had, but we've got time, we've got date, we've got location, or not time yet, but general kind of span of time. Uh, but we've got location and we've got date, and like I said, a high level approach. The bigger thing is, what does council want us to focus on with our community as it relates to those topics, to those themes, um, so that we can bring that information back to you all as a body? Councilmember Noble. I was pointing at Councilmember Douglas, but I'll go ahead. Um, I think it's really important uh, to give the residents as much time to say as much as they want to say. Uh, but I would do it just as we do at a city council meeting where people get three minutes so that they're not putting it on a piece of paper and not knowing whether their question is going to be asked or not. So they have three minutes and they can make a question part of that. Um, the clarity regarding um, the consolidated development agreement. You called it existing. Are you saying that it's in place right now? I don't think it is. So don't read too much into the word existing. It's the one that was brought forward to you all to take action on, whether you want us to focus on the extension or if you want us to put that conversation to the side and focus on a new consolidated or let's get away from consolidate, a new master development agreement for reunion going forward. So just a little bit of kind of taking a step back. We were initially discussing an extension of the previous agreement that expired on December 17th. You can't extend an expired agreement. You it, have to start over or something. I leave that, I leave the, I leave that to, to, to Matt to be able to explain. But n nonetheless, that was what was before us back on the 14th was an action by the council to look at extending the previous agreement. It was tabled at that meeting in light of being able to have a town hall conversation on, I, I would call it two distinct items, one that was not clear whether it was the extension or a truly new master development agreement and the reunion sports authority. So part of our conversation back here today is where does the focus as the body lie around the particular items of note? The extension of the CDA that was to be heard on the 14th and then or a new master development agreement wanting to hear from the community about their thoughts, their feelings, their concerns or expectations as well as the sports authority discussion. The original motion reads, uh, I won't put the first part in there, but anyway, uh, that it be continued with the condition that staff and Oakwood Homes have a town hall style meeting for the public to discuss the sports and entertainment district as well as the CDA. Okay. So that's what we need to make room for the residents to be able to do. But is it the is, is extension, it, reinstatement and extension of the original one, or are we talking about the new one? The master development agreement. Well, I think it should be, you know, I would suggest, Mr. Hader, could you, could you tell me whether an agreement that expired is extended? This was the, this was the direction that this is what we were asked to do, is provide a document that retroactively extended the agreement. So in other words, um, the amendment or the extension that's going to be, that was put in the packet for that last meeting made, it was basically backdated to December 17th of last year. So it filled in the gap. Um, you will be receiving um, a memo at some point here in the next couple of weeks that goes through that agreement, but and also talks about the the impact of, of retroactively dating something. You can certainly do it. There's there's risk with everything, um, but it's something that we can certainly do. And that was a direction of that was given, and that's what we prepared and provided to council. 
Well, how do we resolve the problem that, that the city council hasn't even had the ability to weigh in on the content of these agreements? The, the last motion that was made was basically to bring something forward so that you could have that discussion um, and have a, or, um, an ordinance on first reading about whether you wanted, and what debate whether you wanted to actually go forward with that or not. Um, and then my request is that, that your proposed amendment to the motion made by Councilmember Grimes then allowed for us to go back and have this um, town hall to get this other involvement and input as well, where, where staff is confused is what should the content of that town hall be? And that's what they're trying to, to focus on and solicit from you guys tonight, whether it should be just about that, that brief extension or, or additional information input that would um, color their um, drafting and negotiations and moving forward with a different master agreement for the future. Did I say that accurately? Okay. Spot on. But it does get back to the issue of if you don't know, if, this, if the city council hasn't discussed what they would wish to be in an agreement or multiple agreements, because that necessarily hasn't even been defined whether it should be a master or a consolidated agreement per discussion, then what are we showing, are we showing something to the residents? I wanted the residents to have, to be able to weigh in on this. That's really what I wanted. Yeah. So appreciate that. Um, I would say, you know, we as staff have and will remain at the ready to have a conversation with council if it's particular to your expectations around negotiating terms and conditions that we can have with Oakwood Homes, that we can have ultimately with the community to make them aware, whether it's through a town hall or whether it's through other forms of, of communication. What has been, I say, a complexity for us as staff is trying to understand what is that general direction as it may be from the body and how we go about communicating that to the important uh, stakeholders that are engaged in the actual agreement, but ultimately as well as the community that have taken an interest in wanting to understand the tenets of that agreement. So the town hall represents an opportunity for those expectations to be made aware of that ultimately we can get initial feedback or if I may say and just be and put this on table, is the town hall premature given that there's the, com the conversation in and around the expectations with this body, we as staff are still waiting to be able to act on? Well, you, the date wasn't set by us, it was set by you that it would come back on April 18th. So. That's why the town hall is being at, at a particular thing. The, the consolidated development agreement or agreements could be at any point in the future, and we could still have a meeting to discuss this. Fair enough. That being said, and I appreciate that while the date was set, I would say what's also has led us to this conversation is the thinking amongst council whether it's as a body or individual, may not be in alignment across. And that's what we're trying to get into alignment for us as staff to make sure that we hit the mark with whatever that expectation might be. Okay, it would be easier to see your face if Councilmember Badera wasn't holding his hand up in front of it, but I think he's trying to make a point that he wants to speak. Well, I'd put it down if you let us talk too. <laughs> I think I would, Councilmember Douglas was after me anyway. Councilmember Douglas. Yeah, so the whole, whole point of this, because we were, we were going to have a special meeting and we were going to have a, a vote and the, the citizens came out to express themselves and express their concerns. And so that's when the town hall became part of the equation. So we obviously have very engaged citizens and they're paying attention. So 
you need to give them their town hall. And I would say, don't put on a dog and pony show to tell them what they need to think. I believe that you need to acknowledge their concerns and hear them out. Um, I've been to meetings like, or, or presentations like this before, where they're trying to explain away why the taxes are so high here and, and having all these, these charts and beautiful pictures around the room, to me, <laughs> is an insult to their intelligence. You need to, you, you, you need to acknowledge them as, as an important part of the future of our community. So that is my take on all of this. So don't pander to them, please. One of the basic problems is that there's a lot of misinformation and that there are four different issues that are being garbled and interspersed in people's minds. And I can tell that from reading the emails that come in. So we have to reset at a basic fundamental level of here are the facts regarding this issue, here are the facts regarding that issue, so that people understand what's going on with whether it's a filing or the CDA or the sports and entertainment district. So we're going to have to provide a certain amount of information. And I hope people don't view that as pandering or speaking down to them. There, there's just a tremendous amount of misinformation that's out there right now. So we have to reset in order to have a rational discussion about these issues. So I, I just want to make that clear that there's a, there's a bunch of information that has to be straightened out, and you know let's let's get back to the facts and then have a discussion from those facts. Uh, on that note, and what staff is really trying to to suss out from from city council tonight is the motion that was made asked that 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 town hall style meeting for the public to discuss the sports and entertainment district as well as the CDA. Now the sports and entertainment district was never a part of the CDA, which obviously, obviously the implication is you want more beyond just the CDA and that extension. And what they're trying to figure out is the scope of that direction from two weeks ago, because it's a little vague in the motion that was made. So they're really trying to meet your needs. So that's what we're looking for, just that clarity. Councilmember Madera. Yeah, I think that's kind of spot on where we're talking about several different things here. So we have to, you know, in this town hall say, okay, what does the CBA do? And what does extending the CBA do? What's included in here? What would you like to see included? What does the sports entertainment district do? How does that work? How is that separate from the CBA? Because there is a lot of misinformation and people are intertwining these things that are really two separate issues that, you know, the CBA is how many years old and the sports entertainment district just came not too many years ago, you know, the, and that was all conceptual when it did come. So we have to, you know, reset, say, what's the CBA? Why is it needed? Why does reunion need one? Uh, what does having one do? And what does not having one do? And then, the sports entertainment district, how does that work? How is that separate from the CBA and how does the CBA affect that? Because, you know, I, I think some people are going on social media and putting things out there that are really getting things twisted and, and really, I guess, explain the process of how these things work going forward. How can someone be involved in these discussions um, because you know the CBA I don't think anyone here was involved in those discussions because that was uh, before most of our time and the sports entertainment district how does you know one get involved with that because that's going to be probably a separate land use case and PUD that comes forward so you know what, what's the timeline for that because I think people are 
get into this um, point where it's like all I've been hearing later, lately is the developer promised me this, the developer promised me that, and you know, when these plans come forward, they're all conceptual until you know the PUD gets ironed out, till it actually gets built, and you know what's the timeline for that? So I think part of that town hall is you know providing that education. And then opening it up for, for the feedback, you know, what, what people want. Because the CBA is more of a negotiation, right? Um, if we're giving concessions as a city, we're going to expect things in return. What, what does that look like? You know, is that infrastructure? Is that recreation? Is that that entertainment district? And so we need to clarify that, I think, first of all. So it's almost two pieces, right? Break it out into... The, the different parts, and then provide a little bit of background on those and uh, information on them, and then open it up for a discussion. Because um, I, I don't think it's beneficial to have a town hall if you know the, the feedback that you're providing isn't going to be something that's going to be pragmatic just because of the way that things work and not knowing you know, what the process is. I think the the important thing for me is that this covers a huge swath of land in North Commerce City that will determine what North Commerce City looks like in many ways. And that's what residents want to have some involvement in. They may have missed the um, couple or three opportunities or something with the comprehensive plan, but this is pretty much like doing a comprehensive plan for North Commerce City. And that discussion needs to happen because they really want it to happen. And I can't, you know, we can't do anything about commitments that were made just as we can't fix the problem, at least in terms of the commitment that developers made in Buffalo Highlands, for example, that promised a different kind of park there. But when there is an expectation, when people have expectations about what they want their community to look like, that's the part that I really want to be able to hear. And there's details in the CDA, there's details in the, in the other one. You know, people are not going to necessarily know those all that well. There's parts of the CDA that I've looked at that, um, you know, I would recommend removing it. And I'm not just talking about the, the 1%, but other aspects of it. I see three different categories of, um, of communities. The Reunion Ridge, which was uh, designed for first responders, apparently, and, and teachers and so forth. So it was supposed to be the more attainable housing. Then you had the area behind several, you know, a few miles away. Then you have the area behind King Supers, which is, uh, well, let me go back to Reunion Ridge again. You have Reunion Ridge, which has uh, the potential of the 24 wells. It has a gas pipeline and it has electrical lines and it's near the arsenal. Then you go to King Supers and behind King Supers, that was theoretically supposed to be active adults and, and with a potential nine hole golf course. Then you go another few miles away and now you're at uh, Tower and 104th, which is a very major intersection in terms of an introduction to Commerce City coming in from, <coughs> from the east and at, the, at that end. So, People ha just have, they want to be able to participate and they have expectations. I haven't been reading these letters because of the um, um, comments that we'd received about not looking at any of the material due to the fact that we will be in these quasi-judicial roles and I didn't know when they would be coming up. So I don't know whether people are informed or not informed. I can't answer that question, but if, if you need to clarify it, then I would at a minimum not confuse people by doing anything other than bringing back the old one that expired in December and do that one only as opposed to, to a new one. 
because otherwise it will be confusing. The old one is the only one that the public has access to because it was actually part of our agenda. So, if you're going to so explain that, it, if you're going to explain anything, then that would be the one to explain. Don't explain anything else because anything else isn't anything anyone knows about. They simply need the opportunity to participate in this process. Three minutes, just as you do at a city council meeting, it could be, easily be a city council meeting too. Sometimes when, when residents come to comment on things, they can go until early morning hours because there's so many people who want to speak and maybe there won't be. We have no idea, but I think it's important at this point because this defines, this will define North Commerce City. So if the, if the CDA, as, as the motion was made, is retroactively extended from, for six months from December 17th and it will expire approximately May 17th of, of this year, so, which means that if we have this town hall meeting and we don't get feedback on what people want to see in a future master development agreement, in other words, if we just explain the previous one, then we're, then we're either need to have another meeting or we're gonna, or the public's not give that opportunity that we know you want them to have, that you all want them to have. No, they would give their feedback. They would say, no, this part's unacceptable. This is what I want instead. They would be giving feedback but just not on a, on a new one. We haven't participated in a new one, so I don't want to see a new one given to the residents on the 6th. I wanna hear what they have to say, then we can look at a new one after that. If, if, if I may, I'm just gonna ask a threshold question here. I'm, I'm hearing around the table, there's, there's still some mixing of conversations around the table. So primarily the CDA has a forbearance on the horizontal infrastructure. It does not have a forbearance on the vision of the community as it is built. It does include, it has references to a PUD. It has references to development agreements. All of those are part of the CDA and we haven't seen those. It, true, they have references, but it doesn't change the underlying zoning. It references the underlying zoning in which will be built as it is approved. It does not change zoning. The only thing that changes zoning is a PUD zone document to change zoning. So the CDA, what it outlines, the current CDA outlines how certain improvements that are in support of the PUD will come to bear. Whether it is through the sales and use tax sharing or whether it's through the city or it's gonna be purely through the developer in, in the sense of how it was drafted in the 20. It does not change whether, whether or not that property is going to be able to be built for residential or commercial. So I, I, the reason why I bring that up, ma'am, is that when we go to make that presentation at the town hall, I wanna be able to speak matter of factly that while yes, there is this perception of the vision of reunion from a land use, that, that, that implementation, that delivery is not going to be born in the CDA. There's certain aspects of our partnership in the CDA that certain improvements may not come in support of certain land uses that the Z PUD has already been identified and approved for since the early, late 90s, early 2000s. So I, I, I wanna make sure that we're being clear as well and that we're not creating an expectation that, is, that we can't deliver. Well, I just raised an expectation that there would actually be three development agreements as opposed to one CDA. So I do think that that's something to be considered as well, that because none of these three properties have anything in common other than they're in North Commerce City and they have the same developer involved, that there isn't, they aren't uh, contiguous, um, they don't share um, infrastructure, um, any, of, any of that, any of that stuff. No more so than, than you know, Buckley Ranch and Buffalo Mesa. Uh, 
That's true to some extent, but there are shared infrastructure. Uh, I'll give you Chambers Road as an example. So uh, the active adult development that you reference that will be on the west side of Chambers Road. Um, the other development, I forget if it, what filing it's called. Right, Village 8. Village 8, right across the road. Yep. On the east side of Chambers. You know, so they share Chambers. They also all drain into Second Creek. You know, and, and that was the advantage of a CDA was to deal with infrastructure that is broader than just a single subdivision. And so uh, when you have a master developer, it's different than a simple neighborhood developer that comes in, buys 80 acres, you know, and plats it out, gets approval from the city and builds it and then moves on. This is truly a master plan. Uh, it's a master plan community and you know, there's what three thousand acres left to develop yet at this point. So you know, it it's a it's a different world in in that sense from an individual developer. And, and so that's where a consolidated de development agreement is an advantage because you coordinate the infrastructure between those different disparate parts. And, and that's the the reason the rationale for the original one, as I understand it. Uh, which was put in place, you know, before I participated. But again, that's the idea that we would have going forward, is so that we have those uh, infrastructure elements that are planned out. And Chambers Road, for an example, if if we just went by the individual developments, it'd be piecemeal. You, you'd have a, a Part of it widened out to four lanes, and then you'd have a two-lane section, and then it'd be four lanes. Well, with all else. due respect, Chambers Road isn't isn't an example because the east side something will happen on the east side one way or the other when there is a determination. It's the west side that is the will be the remaining parcel. There isn't anything on the east side otherwise, is there? What is what are you referring to? There's a development just south of 112th Avenue that will be, so. Won't that, that be determined on March 7th? If I may finish, please. There's development ha occurring on both sides of Chambers Road in that area. Further south, there's the existing part of Reunion that has already been developed, but Chambers Road hasn't been widened. Further south from that, you have Second Creek drainage area. And then you're at the Reunion uh, King Supers development and Reunion Marketplace on the east side. So that's why I'm saying it's piecemeal unless you enter into an agreement that bridges all of those different areas and makes sure that the infrastructure is improved all the way. You have the same type of thing with Second Creek. That, that's what I'm referring to. But you could make um, the King Supers property along chambers be one agreement. That could be one agreement on both the east and west side. That could be one agreement. Then there could be one agreement for Reunion Ridge and there could be one agreement for Tower and, um, and 104th. Can be. In, and it's in three separate wards. It's represented by three separate council members. I am, it, it, it gives everyone an opportunity to weigh in on separate, um, projects in terms of what they would like to see at these various projects in terms of amenities or whatever else that there might be. And it gives us an opportunity to look at things like, you know, there's a, a floodway in the one behind King Supers. There is, you know, the other uh, challenges for Reunion Ridge. There are, um, uh, you know, Tower and 104th is different because of the uh, highway and Tower Road going through and the new uh, parkway, for example. It, they're all, they have no, nothing in common. So, very true, you can have three individual development agreements, but the argument that's being made is being made off the assumption that e in each one of those individual development agreements that we're gonna be able to request the similar level of improvements and the thing that we have to abide and 
we have to hold ourselves to is the rational nexus and rough proportionality argument. Because in each one of those individual agreements, right, we have to hold them to what their project creates an impact in the community, not totality. So widening of Chambers Road, going back to Rogers Point, or um, Potomac Parkway, let's just use that example because that's by Reunion Ridge. They may be only required to do intersection improvements, but they may not be required to build Potomac Parkway out to its full width because it may be viewed as a regional improvement that not just Reunion Ridge be responsible for, but a whole litany of other projects over time would be required to have to participate or the responsibility falling on the city. So what the master development agreement allows is that negotiation above the rough proportionality and, rough and rational nexus because we have a willing participant as far as the developer because they're looking at that bigger picture because of the impact of their development of wanting to be able to make those regional improvements with the city in a, as part of that effort. They could easily say, yes, we'll just do a development agreement and we will focus on our, our, on our turn lane improvements, we will focus on our traffic signal improvements, and that will be that. And then the widening will still then fall to the city in order for us then to be able to move forward. I don't know that that's necessarily the case. We just had a discussion earlier tonight about uh, Buffalo Run paying for one half of 120th. So you mean Village of Buffalo Run East. So in that project, paying for half of the, pro half of the roadway, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, um, while we've been able to have an open negotiation and an open discussion, we have a willing participant to engage and to work with us. That's the key thing, a willing participant and party to engage with us on that improvement. They can easily go say, city, we no longer have a desire in wanting to improve the south half of the portion of, of 120th. Our development has been approved, our development is in, and we have met our obligations as required by the various tests of either the traffic study and or associated documentation to have met our intersection, our turn lanes, and our traffic signals. But we have a willing participant, whether it's the Metro District or a developer, that is wanting to work with us on advancing an improvement that will be a regional benefit for those in Brighton, unincorporated Adam County, and also in the Northern Range. So while that's not a development agreement, because that, that time has come and gone, we're working through an IGA with a body that wants to partner with us to actually see that improvement. So, I'm assuming that um, any developer would want to cooperate with us, including the one we're, we're talking with. And so just as, the Buffalo Run folks are, I would think that the same thing would apply, that, that there wouldn't be anyone, uh, you know, twisting arms or holding anybody hostage or anything like that. Everybody would want to cooperate. That's the way it works. We all cooperate and it's all for the betterment of the city. No, we've had developers say, go pound sand. Well, I can't imagine that would happen in this case. The, if, if I may too. So um, Deputy Manager Rogers addressed um, the, the rough proportionality and the nexus requirements that come from United States Supreme Court cases, one, one called Nolan and one called Dolan. Um, and then there's subsequent case law that, that talks not even about must your, you know, these, these exactions you require have that proportionality and that, that um, nexus, but it can be a constitutional violation to even ask for something that is beyond that what a master development agreement provides is an opportunity to ask for things that are beyond that. And that's one of the significant reasons where basically if you cast a bigger net, you're gonna get a bigger take. But that also means that we're giving something that they wouldn't otherwise get from those development agreements either. So I, I think what you're trying, what you're hearing a lot of is 
if we can bring these things together in a vision that, that incorporates and monetize an infrastructure together, we'll get more out of it and we're not exposing ourselves to liability at the same time. So I'd like to clarify something. You bring up Metro District and developer, and we use these terms interchangeably, but they're quite a bit different. In the case of 120th Avenue, the developer has come and proposed an IGA using money from a Metro District that does not come from that developer. It comes from the homeowners who purchased a home within that Metro District, and we keep mixing these two terms interchangeably. And, and, and the same can be said for any development that relies on a metro district, because it's not the homeowners within that metro district who have come forward and said, I'd really like to see this project done. Will you please take my money and go get it done? It's somebody else who has come forward and said, I have access to these people's money. I'll give it to you, and you give me some, and we'll get the project done. And, and it, it just, it, we continue to just conflate those two on a regular basis, and we need to start separating them. And we need to start having a distinction of who's actually making the agreement and who's actually funding the agreement that's being made, because they're totally different people. Now, my question on this consolidated development agreement, I'm, I'm again having a hard time squaring my head on this. Because on one hand, we're saying the consolidated development agreement gives us the opportunity to have regional drainage. Okay, great, that sounds awesome in theory. It also gives us the opportunity to make sure Chambers Road is done so it's not patchwork. Great, sounds good in theory. But at the same time, on November 2nd, we went to Commerce City Voters and the NIGID and said, hey, allow us to take out new bonds so that we can pay for this detention pond and allow us to pay for redo on Chambers Road. So if this consolidated development agreement was so good, why did we have to go to the voters and ask them for more money? because we have dozens and dozens of additional projects that have to be built. And we don't, A, we don't have a consolidated agreement in place now, and B. At the time of the election, that agreement was in place. Was. For the last 20 years, that agreement was in place. So if that agreement was so good, why weren't those projects already done and they wouldn't have been on our list to say NIGID voters, please give us the opportunity to take out bonds to pay for these projects. So the report that was given to council uh, it's probably, I'll say a year and a half ago now. Um, we had reimbursed Reunion $11.5 million. During that period of time, they turned in uh, requests for $32.5 million. So we have reimbursed them 11 and a half of the 32 and a half that they've spent. Now. I would argue that the old consolidated agreement was not clear in terms of what really qualifies, you know, for public money from us. And that's one of the purposes that would be in the new agreement. What exactly are we paying for and when approximately would it be built? You, know, you, you, you can't give them set deadlines because you don't know if the economy is going to, you know, go kablooey. In the, next six months or if it continues on you know so it's all market driven from that standpoint but to give you an idea that's that's what they've spent and that's the claims that they've turned in 32 and a half million dollars we've reimbursed 11 and a half out of that now in terms of metro district being conflated with uh the developer it's either going to come from taxes through the metro district or it's going to be in the higher price of the home one of the two and so, you know, how you choose to go forward is your choice, but be aware of that, that it's gonna result in higher prices in the house, or people are gonna pay through it, pay for it through taxes, one of the two. You know, but, and, and but that's let me, just the Let reality. me interject on that comment. In 2017, unfortunately, the United States Congress and the President of the United States passed in the tax bill, which changed the way the taxes can be calculated and limited state and local taxes to $10,000. Mortgage interest is still 100% tax deductible. So it is better for a home buyer to be able to roll that into their interest and into that payment than it is to throw it into the property taxes, which they can no longer fully deduct. 
Yeah. And, and that changes how it is that development needs, development needs to start moving forward. Now, on the flip side, you could argue that people are better able to afford a house that's at a lower price point coming in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, that's, so. and that is disingenuous because whenever you look at your disclosure documents and it says your property taxes are going to be $1,000 because those values are listed on the vacant land sitting there. So yes, it allows people to move in at a much more affordable rate, but then whenever the assessor comes by and realizes there's a house sitting on top of that property and the taxes go from $1,000 to $8,000, they can no longer afford to live there. Now they're stuck in a position of trying to unload the house and then being liable for capital gains taxes because they didn't stay in the house for two years. Whereas if everything had been upfront cost right in the beginning and disclosed fully of this is what it is going to cost you to live in this house, maybe they wouldn't have made the decision to purchase that house because they couldn't actually afford it. Again, how, how you move forward is counsel's choice. I, you know, I'm not going to tell you that. you shouldn't do this or you should do that. There are advantages to a consolidated agreement. And, and yes, we can do individual agreements. You know, so there, there's, there's choices here. Just be aware of the consequences of those choices. Absolutely, but I would just like to see where the true benefit of that consolidated agreement comes. Because on one hand, we're saying we can get this. Mm -hmm. But for the last 20 years, we haven't had that. And now we're sitting here with a $3 billion deficit that we're trying to make up in impact fee studies of drainage and road impact fees that shouldn't that have been taken care of by our consolidated development agreement to make sure that we weren't in a hole like that? But again, reunion isn't the total of our development. You sure. know, so right. we, we've but, got... But you mentioned specifically drainage right. between those two properties and you mentioned specifically Chambers Road, which is where I've contained my argument on. So I I'm, think... I, I was think, just I, using those as right. illustrations. You sure. know, reunion had to... I forget how many acres of land, which is maybe, what, 10% of our total area to develop? You know, so even though they're, they're a master developer with a huge area, they're by no means all of the area. You know, so we've got all of these other areas that have improvements that have to be made as well. well see, now, now you've just made Councilmember Noble's point because you just said they're 10% of the development area, but they all have to be developed together in one consolidated agreement when every other property out there has to be developed under their own development agreement. And so it kind of, again, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth here by saying one thing and then turn around and contradicting it what we're saying on the next. I don't really want to continue belaboring the point on this because I think that this is all arguments that we're going to continue to have for the next six weeks until we get to April 18th. I think the, the consensus is we want a robust town hall that number one educates the residents. Number two, gives the opportunity for residents to provide feedback. And number three, allows us to listen to what the residents have to say so that whenever we have to make those decisions, we can make the decisions with the best information possible. Everything else beyond that, we are debating points that are going to have to be debated 10 more times before April 18th. So just one point of clarification. Reinstating and extending the CDA or talking about a new one that is conceptual at this point? I, I, I think you're going to end up with a split council on that. And I think that you're going to have people who are going to say that CDA that was put in in 2001 was based on a land development code that was written in 1985. And here we are in 2022 with a 2009, 2011 land development code. Things have changed since then. There are issues of vested rights that I think are going to be a sticky point on there. So going back and just saying, let's reinstate something that um, hasn't fully worked as intended with that old language may not make the most sense to half the council. The other half the council probably wanting to get this to move forward and get this done and everything, probably let's just get it going. I don't know. But in my personal opinion, and again, it's just my personal opinion, we need to start over with a new one that takes into account the 2009-2011 Land Development Code and takes into account the current market conditions that exist within Commerce City. Council Member Ford. I know Council Member Hurst has had his hand up for a long time. I'd like to defer to him and go afterwards. Right. Go ahead. Um, I won't go into the other, any of the other points. I really wanted to just clarify kind of 
I had a bit of a different understanding going into what was potentially going to be a special meeting. I, I don't think we were asking at all to extend the old one, but a very chopped up version of the old one to cover our liabilities that were discussed here just tonight. There was no, t no TIF involved. There were, you know, it was my understanding that, that Matt and his team were going through it line by line to make sure I mean, there are changes, that we weren't going to just approve something that has essentially changed in the law since the time. And so we were, gonna, we were taking out quite a bit of what has been called out tonight, but covering our liabilities while we develop a brand new one. And my intention was a brand new one. Doesn't, not necessarily a single line copy and pasted from one to the next, but to cover the city in between when we had no agreements at all with developments in process, what liabilities were we missing? Um, that seemed to be a completely different than what uh, direction we were going. Um, and that, that's where the conversation changed and it turned into let's make sure we get a, a, a hearing to happen or a, a public meeting. So didn't interject, I still stand by that's a really good thing for us to do is to um, hear from the citizens about what they want, um, what they think is wrong, because I still think every intention was to get a brand new one. But in the meantime, um, again, the short term, six months, really wasn't six months because you're going backdate it, um, to ensure that we're covering our liabilities until the new one could be uh, debated, voted on, and then, you know, hopefully passed uh, before the end of that six month extension. So really wanted to make sure that it was at least stated that uh, I could have been going to it a bit blind, but I, I, I believe that there was uh, quite a bit of that was going to be left out of the original agreement just to get us to a new one. So I think the original question that you asked, my answer would be a hybrid of what, uh, of what you're saying. It's not one or the other. I, I, I wanted to talk about what was removed from the old agreement and what, what we were uh, projecting to stay in to keep us uh, covering our liabilities. But then as soon as that discussion's over, you start the next one. Okay. At the end of that six months, we would absolutely, or, or before we would absolutely have to have a brand new CDA in that brand new CDA, what are our top goals? What would we like to see? Hear that from the uh, from everybody um, within the city, all of our constituents, and talk about kind of like what you were talking about, Roger. There was no parameters to where that thirty-two million dollar came about. We set those parameters moving forward. I think we've talked about that identifying projects that are kind of a must as we move forward um, when it comes to where that you know city money is going like you're suggesting the 11 and a half million we need to have a say on that 11 and a half million moving forward you know we would have um similar to what you're talking about at potomac you know building it all the way out we would set that okay if there's a development on this side of the road um at a certain size we would obviously want the whole road to be built instead of uh, it being piece worked where you have, you know, sidewalk on one side, not on the other. Where I think the agreement that we, I want to understand at least is, so we're, we're, we're coming to an agreement and the city's going to pay for the other side, say, because there's no development on the other side, on the, on the east side. How does the city re get that money back? You know, so say all of a sudden a, a new development comes in on the east side, we already had paid for the sidewalk. I want to know in that agreement that, that that project was done, it was done at a fair, maybe even through an RFP price, so we're not just saying it's a million dollars a mile. Well, I don't know that that's the going rate. You know, it could be the going rate for this development, but we need to make sure that that's fair. And then <laughs> that east side development comes back and says, um, or pays us back for, for what we invested into to completing the road on the front side, if, if you get what I mean. So. Really, my, my, my one problem is 
when we put our money in, the 11 and a half million, you talk about not having parameters around uh, what qualifies, and then we get a, a request for 32 and a half million. That's where I really want to see the big changes is, first of all, you know, that 32 and a half million, someone feels like the city's on the hook for that. I'm sure there's a debate back and forth on what we're actually on the hook for. That's where I think with what the mayor is saying is it needs to be more clearly defined there. And that, that's where the only acceptable path forward, in my mind, is a new CDA that, that gets into that layer of detail. For the same reasons we've argued, I think all collectively is that in 2000 or 2002, with a kind of blank sheet in the north, putting strict parameters around it may, may have been more prohibitive. But now that we have kind of, you know, say 50% build out or more, you can start to see the, the, the priority needs and we have more of an opportunity to spell those out in our CDA. And if we can spell those out, then you're potentially seeing those, those benefits that a CDA can bring you. Otherwise, um, then the three, the three different agreements may make more sense because you're not getting those, those benefits that, are you know, that would be necessary to have a successful CDA. So I think it's a hybrid for me of I want to hear you know, how to prevent our liabilities from, from being out there now, but I want a brand new one at the end of, you know, when it's time, you know, the end of six months or five months, just as soon as we have, an, you know, one that we have paved out, we, we can attack it right then. Council Member Ford. I have to agree with a lot of what's been said around the table, including um, Council Member Noble and, and the mayor, as well as Mr. Hurst. Um, when we were voting on that, my understanding was it was just to bridge the time until a new one was developed. So I'm expecting a new one or three new ones. Whatever benefits the residents of Reunion the most. The downside about what's going on is there's information about sports and entertainment, um, which I haven't voted on anything to do with the sports and entertainment, but people think I have. They think I'm against it. I saw it in concept years ago. I'm, I've, I was supportive of it then. I'm still supportive of it. Um, so there's a lot of bad information out there. Um, I also want to tell you that I watched uh, River Run, which is where I live, and, and I watched the city come in, and we did the roads, and there were areas of Peoria Street that were narrowed up because there was houses that didn't participate as part of the development. And I think when you develop a road, you need to develop the whole road so that both sides can carry the traffic necessary. One side of the road doesn't cover the needs for the development. It, it's both sides of the road because people go both directions. And I, I ran into a, a scenario on, um, trying to think of the name of the road, Sable. 120th and Sable, Adams Crossing on the west side and it's Brighton, and on the east side is the old truck stop. The truck stop folks wanted to develop a new truck stop. They were told they have to develop the entire road. And the, the, the issue was, why do we need to develop Adams Crossing side of the road? Well, you need to develop the whole, the whole road. Well, what if we don't develop and we let Adams Crossing develop first? then Adams Crossing has to develop the whole road and you need to pay them back for your half. And if you develop first, they have to pay you back for their half. So guess what has happened? There's no development on either side of the road because nobody wants to front the entire road. I want reunion to be developed in the best manner possible with the best commercial opportunities and the best living qualities for the residents that are there. When you have this town hall meeting, I would like you to get information, explain what a developer agreement is, get the information on what the residents want to see and how it would work, whether, whether one half the road gets done or both half the roads get done, and make sure that we're developing that, that major development in the right manner to benefit the residents long term. That's what I would like to see. Um, I recently just had to go up, I didn't have to, I went up to help a friend hang 
ceiling fans and some stuff in his new house. He lives along 96th Avenue, just a few blocks to the west of Tower Road. And he goes, hey, I really love the community. I love being here. However, um, he said, I can't wait until the development across the street happens. To the west, he lives on the north side of 96th Avenue. To the west is an empty lot. And I said, really, what's happening there? He goes, oh, there's going to be a Target and uh, a steakhouse. I mean, he went into detail about what brand of commercial was going to be across the street from him. And I said, well, you know, from an obvious perspective, Target's not going to build another Target that close to Prairie Centers. So I, and, and not only that, who told you this? And he said, well, the sales office told me that. And I said, well, I have to tell you that the sales office was selling you a house. And so the downside to it is that a lot of these sales offices, over the years, I have, I've had complaints later on that, with, that someone was supposed to have access to a lake for their jet skis, there was going to be a target next door, and part of the misinformation, some of it is coming from sales offices, realtors, promising people things that are not there that nobody else promised them. And I don't know if that was the situation with the park, but I know it was a situation with the lake in the dunes where they were going to have private boat ramps, private docks. And um, I know it's the situation with this gentleman that just bought a new home that there's going to be a target across the street, which is totally untrue. So we also have to try to make sure that whoever's developing in our community, that the sales offices aren't selling them a line of crap to sell a house because it's happening all the time. But it's very important for me to let the residents know I have not heard a case concerning sports and entertainment because I am supportive of sports and entertainment and I'd like to base my decision on that case after I hear the case in its totality. But there's, there's so much stuff out there, um, it, it's totally crazy, some of the stuff that I'm reading. And it's like, look, that's never come before us. I, I don't know what you're talking about. So at the town hall, I'd like to get the resident's perception of what a development agreement is. Because I, I know, I never ever did I have the, the thought that we would continue with the old agreement. The thought was that the staff was negotiating a new agreement and the, and the time ran out on the old agreement, so they needed more time, and it was chopped up just like Councilman Hurst said, with no TIF or anything else like that, just to get, to not stall the opportunity for the development to occur. So I think it's important that we hear from the residents on what they think a development agreement looks like, whether it's a master development agreement or whether it's three individual development agreements, and so that they can get what they want in their development. But we also know that it's, it, it can't come to us until you negotiate that with the developer. And it makes it tough because now all this stuff is spun together and it's about who's against what, and it's not the case. Um, you know, I had a gentleman just call me about the park. Well, are you yes or no on the park? I said, well, I'd like to see what the, what the cost and the size and what the amenities are and how it's getting paid for so that I can make that determination. I'm supportive of the park. I just don't know if the park is 100 acres, 5 acres, 10 acres, 20 acres, and what, what is all involved with the park. So uh, it makes it tough when you start getting people pounding you on, especially right now, stuff that's quasi-judicial and that we shouldn't be engaging in. And um, I want the best for the residents of Reunion. I want them to understand what a development agreement is instead of just being told. One person tells one person tells one person tells one person pretty soon. I don't even know what they're talking about because the intent of the discussion the, a few weeks ago was a bridge for negotiations to continue to come back to this council with a new 
opportunity for a development agreement or whether the staff came back and said, no, three's better. And then we're still going to have discussion about that. But instead, we, we have the cart way in front of the horse. And I'd like to get the cart back behind the horse and make sure our, our residents, especially those in reunion, that these things affect, have the real information so that they can give us some feedback on whether we have one or three development agreements and how that will affect the development of reunion when it comes to major roadways that have to be built. Councilmember Douglas. Thank you. So if you're talking about a chopped up agreement, and obviously you probably know something about a chopped up agreement, but I don't know anything about that. And I sure would like to know why <laughs> this old agreement is, is being pushed so hard to be extended for six months. The, the devil is in the details. I do not know what the details are. And so there was supposed to be a special meeting where we were going to vote on whether we would extend it without the, the uh, um, share back of, of tax dollars. But there's something more to this than, than meets the eye to me. <laughs> and I, I wanna know what, what it is. So I would like to have the staff go through that agreement and, and tell me exactly what everything is and what the possibilities are. We're, we have a, a shortfall on, on the, the, the uh, impact fees. So what does that mean? If it's extended for six months and something gets passed, it, the old impact fees apply? I, I want to know what's going on here. And for, to me, I'm in the dark. And, and I want to know what I'm voting on before. And I want to know the details of it before I vote on it. I'm not going to extend something when I don't know what the heck it is I'm extending. Thank you. If I may, that's completely fair. And you'll get a memo. You all get a memo from the city attorney's office explaining the, the CDA and um, the impact of excising Article 8, which is what we were asked, asked to do last and put before council last time in the, uh, in the amendment, um, and explaining the retroactivity um, and how that impacts it so that you can make an informed decision as to whether or not you want to renew that retroactively or not. And if I may, Mayor, What I've heard from council tonight is that you like a robust conversation, a well thought out conversation with the, with the community on a number of different items and topics as it relates to what a, C, what a development agreement is, what is the benefit, what comes with it, what does not come with it, a distinction between the parameters and how those parameters can be set vision the reason why i say that as it currently is constructed the town hall is a night if we want this conversation with the community to be successful more than likely it's not going to happen in one night and i'm just being honest because once again the complexity of the conversation that we just had around this table for the last hour still hasn't led to a clear distinction of expectations, and I don't mean that negatively, it's just, it's, it's meaty. It's a meaty topic. It's a complex topic. So the reason why I bring that up is we may ultimately want to think about additional meetings that it may push the 18th back if we want to do it right so that you have a comprehensive understanding from the community, because like I said, it's a meaty topic. Councilmember Noble. Um, I think what's most important is that when uh, the speakers come to the town hall, that we're all on the same page. So whatever is in writing to discuss, everybody has seen it in advance. And 
so that no one is in a position of saying, well, no, that's not in it. No, no, we changed that. No, no, no. I want everybody to be respected. And the only way we can do that is to do it all from the same piece of paper. So whether it's the hybrid or it's using the old one and saying, we're not doing this anymore, we're not doing this part, because I want to be very clear. When I voted to let it expire in December, I did it intentionally because of its contents. That did not mean I didn't want another agreement. I didn't want that agreement. So I want to be very clear about that. As for the various projects, I was in the, uh, in the chambers, in the audience, before I was a city council member in August of 2019. There was a presentation of uh, several different uh, districts on August 5th. Two weeks later, on August 19th, several service plans came forward that were voted upon by the city council. And it, all of these dovetailed together it's the August, 9th, August 5th agenda and the August 19th agenda of 2019. So people can see what was brought to the city council and they can see on the, 9th, on the 19th what everyone voted for. It's more important today that we are all fully informed because I think that there was an aspect where there was a lot of rubber stamping going on and not really a chance to look as thoroughly at things that needed to be to be looked at. So um, that's where we are now. We have people who have asked really intelligent questions. They may be a little off on facts, according to some council members, but that doesn't mean that they aren't asking really intelligent questions. And we need to be sure to also treat them as an equal with the developer. So it doesn't sound like we're defending, you know, that that it's a developer versus resident. It is, it is a staff presenting facts that aren't colored with, um, let's make sure we're presenting the case on the behalf of the, um, of the developer, for example. Council Member Hurst. Yeah, I just think there's one more point to clarify or that I'd like to clear up. I think there's two, there was two paths presented in front of us before. You either go to executive session to talk about our direction when you're negotiating a CDA, or to do it in public in a special meeting and talk about, if we're gonna extend the CDA, we don't want this, we don't want that, we don't want this, but this covers our liabilities. It was my feeling, of course we don't get to talk about why we call a special meeting or how that all comes about. It's my feeling we would have never voted that night. We would have talked about what we didn't want in the CDA extension. We would have tried to come to consensus on how to uh, make that the appropriate uh, bridge, if you will, to the new one. And then you guys would have gone back, made those adjustments, possibly had to, to uh, negotiate further and then move forward again. But to do it in public was the whole intent in the conversation that I had that led to the submittal or the seconding of the meeting, if you will, that, that, that led to the submittal for a special meeting. So we needed to be able to talk through the CDA, the CDA extension, what could, could and couldn't be in there. So obviously we all knew that the TIF wasn't part of the discussion any longer, but what else? Because it was my understanding that there were several other things that, uh, if nothing else, raised red flags. Um, and, and that's where I saw it going in my head, not, all right, we're gonna vote, it's gonna be extended at the end of the night. No, there was a lot to discuss, but how do you do that? There's only two paths. A meeting where we, everything's out on the table and you're kind of negotiating in public or you go to executive session into it. And to me, it just makes sense to do it in a special meeting and dedicate the whole night to that, not it, that was it. And, um, but we went this route and I thought it was just as good to talk about it and have a public meeting. And so that night turned into kind of the discussion we had and then it second, uh, seconded after um, we talked about having a public meeting and kind of 
moving it from a special meeting to that public meeting and kind of talking all the details in that situation. So, uh, of course, that's only one perception, but that's that's was my mindset going into this is that we have to hash this all out, expose the liabilities we have, cover those, and then work towards a new one um, from the ground up. So. I mean, I thought that's what we were doing and then it changed. And so that, that's really where I was coming from at that, at that point is that always we wanted a new one, but what liabilities do we need to cover in the meantime? Mr. Tinklenberg, would you like to give your report? Um, in terms of the city manager's office, uh, of course, we have the planning retreat coming up Friday and Saturday of this week. Uh, there is homework, and I think Annette made the rounds to each of you asking you to fill out that uh, form. Um, Adams 14, we provided a term sheet for their discussion. So again, just giving them some concepts to think about in terms of the uh, advanced degree use of the facility on the Mile High Greyhound Park. Uh, reminder, there is the redistricting community session coming up uh, March 2, so this Wednesday at 6 o'clock at the Eagle Point Recreation Center. In terms of uh, community development, uh, we are still at 174 land use applications. Uh, 512 residential permits have been approved so far this year and building inspections they're at 5,700 and then code enforcement had uh, 2,518 so far this year with 90 percent compliance rate so that's a good compliance rate in terms of emergency rental assistance program we've uh, committed 1.6 million now 1 million six hundred and forty three thousand dollars and all of the phase one Funds have been expended. We're now into the second round of those funds. And then the environmental planner is working with Public Works on exploring uh, charging or grants for EV charging stations. So we'll see if we can get some grant money to install additional charging stations. Um, in terms of court, we have a new judge uh, and the court staff is preparing to onboard him court is also conducting a survey and that is of parties who attended both in person and also virtual court sessions uh, so far the virtual court sessions have been quite successful we'll see if people's reaction is positive or not um, also they are moving to verifying online uh, insurance uh, you know that people are have insurance they're doing that online instead of having to call the individual insurance companies to verify, so it's much more efficient. Uh, in terms of economic development, uh, the economic development director and I interviewed with the editor of Business News regarding development occurring in, in Commerce City. So we'll see how well written that article is. You never know. Um, Jersey Mike Subs is uh, looking to join Wingstop over in the Reunion Station by summer. And then uh, uh, economic development report was uh, made available for the city manager's update. In terms of parks, recreation, and golf, uh, they attended the 2022 Golf Expo, and that was uh, very successful. It beat prior years. Uh, they, they sold preferred players' passes, uh, 239 of those, and then uh, nine-hole passes, 867 of those, and uh, realized 41000 in revenue for that, which beat all prior years as well. Um, 60th, or uh, 270 in Vasquez improvements. We have uh, planned to use 600000 in undergrounding fund monies to move the electric wires underground in that area. So that will be beneficial to that project. And then uh, also planning to initiate design for the uh, commercial piece of the Mile High Greyhound Park. Uh, and that is to uh, meet the overall de uh, Dr. Cog deadline of June of 2024. 
We also have the bridge replacements that are moving forward. Uh, on Peoria, the bottom slab has been completed and the contractor will be pouring the walls this week. And then the bridge deck uh, still uh, on track for paving by the end of March. Of course, that all depends on the weather. And then uh, the Brighton Bridge, that deck will be poured this week as well. And then uh, also on track for completion by the end of March. 96th and Landmark uh, stop sign, they're installing uh, rubber speed bumps and uh, replacing the, the delineators around that stop sign in order to uh, create more visibility. That'll happen when there's a break in the weather. And then uh, the Rosemary Street widening is at, uh, design is at 90% completion. And uh, again, we met with Excel Energy to discuss coordinating the undergrounding of the electrical utility lines in that area. And then we still need to resolve the detention pond property that is needed before we can bid that project. 88th Avenue, uh, that's at 90% uh, plans by May of, of this year. And uh, CDOT is, is considering the environmental assessment and uh, that will depend on some components that are outside of the project's boundary. And then, uh, of course, you've been getting updates from the uh, police chief and from the police department about the uh, fatal accident on Friday night. That was at 112th and 85, involving two vehicles. And uh, those vehicles were occupied by four passengers and the collision resulted in four deaths. Uh, also that same night, they responded to shots fired, and that was uh, up north, and they discovered a, a male that had been shot and two, two males that had been stabbed, and uh, that was a result of a house party. And then shortly after midnight, uh, they responded to another shots fired call uh, down on 74th Avenue, and they discovered a male in the street with an apparent gunshot wound, and he was pronounced deceased at the, at the scene. And then also uh, there was the medical disturbance where five people died from fentanyl poisoning. And then I had a final question for you. So we tried this uh, more consolidated arrangement. Do you prefer this for your study sessions or do you prefer to be on the dais for your study sessions? One says here, two says here, three say here, four. Five, okay, all right. We'll, we'll continue with this then uh, for the near future. So thank you for that. That is the end of my report. Mr. Ader. Um, rarely do I have anything to say, but I do wanna um, let you know that last year, um, City Council authorized an additional FTE um, in the City Attorney's Office, but for the benefit of the Police Department, that was to hire a Police Legal Advisor. Um, we have moved forward with that, and I'm happy to report that we have a new attorney starting on uh, March 14th, um, her name is Ashley Latcher and she will be pretty much housed on the police department side of the wall um, and, and helping out primarily, you know, serving um, the chief and senior management uh, command staff over there. Um, so I wanna thank you all for that on behalf of both the chief of police and, and myself. Um, we look forward to onboarding that attorney next month. Any council members wish to make a report? Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'd um, just like to express my condolences um, to all the family members that lost someone over the last few weeks here in Commerce City. And also just want to let everyone know I did attend the Senior Commission meeting. They're doing great things in the city. And then um, on the 23rd, we had the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion meeting and we did meet with one of the members from the Historical Society and just wanted to let everyone know we still need members um, to serve on that commission. So if anyone's interested, please reach out to someone at the city. Thank you. Councilmember Noble. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, and I um, echo Council Member, I mean, Mayor Pro Tem Alan Thomas's comments uh, regarding uh, sincere condolences to all of the families who lost um, so many in the last two weeks in, uh, in Commerce City. It's been 
It's been tragic, tragic all around. Um, I also wanted to point out that tomorrow there will be a vote on Metro District reform in the state legislature. So um, I hope that our lobbyists can put this on our list because Metro District reform is something that's uh, important for us and it wasn't on our legislation list at all. Um, also, there is discussion about reopening the Cherry Cherokee plant permit for additional air monitors. That was pursuant to last year's legislation, HB 1266. And the idea behind that, of course, is that Suncor is doing it as well. So we shouldn't just single out one company when we have another one in the same position. Um, also, I attended the Sand Creek Greenway um, Board of Directors meeting and also its diversity, equity, and inclusion training session. Um, attended the Senior Commission, they're working on a resource fair and also outreach to residents in senior facilities. Uh, participated in uh, BREDAC. We heard from the consultant, Katie Press, uh, who does commercial, and from Colorado Restaurant Association representative. And I also participated in the Airport Coordinating Committee. We have uh, since then received information about a DIA West approach business development, and I don't know how that plays into the Aerotropolis, but DIA is forging ahead doing business. And I had a meeting with LAI and Continental Development at a, uh, at a site. And again, um, my condolences to all the families. Any other council members wishing to make a report? Council Member Hurst. Yes, I too um, pass along my condolences. It's been incredibly sad and surprising to, to continue to get these emails about what's going on. Um, not, I don't even know what to say. It's uh, been surprising. Be uh, last week I was out of town, but the, the week before, um, we had parks, rec, and golf. Uh, we appreciate um, Roger and Jason. Roger coming and introducing yourself and getting to, um, um, you know, ask ask those in our our boards and commission um, for any feedback. And, and so I just appreciate you you being there. And, and Jason, great presentation, really in depth. Um, we were able to talk about that. And I think there was some really good information about. Uh, you know, this year the uh, Frisbee golf course is gonna be built um, at Frontera Park. Uh, we don't have exact start dates yet, but we're, you know, springtime, early summer. Um, and there was just some good overall information um, at the very end that we discussed about, you know, connection of trails and, and, a, and a few other things. Um, and I just wanted to make sure everybody knew, I think that we've talked about this before, but the Memorial Day parade is full go right now. Um, there were some really good ideas in the uh, first meeting that I attended and I was a little bit late, so there's probably even better ideas that I missed. Um, but uh, the mayor suggested we have more frequent meetings so we can um, have our plan in place and be on time and because it is kind of late in the game, but I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that we are still planning to go uh, full speed ahead at the Memorial Day Parade. Any other council members? Council Member Douglas. Yes, thank you, Mayor Eastman. Um, I also want to express my sincere condolences for all of the families who lost loved ones. Um, one of the um, women who passed on at the uh, tragedy at the apartment complex um, was our daughter's friend from middle school. And um, she had kids. And it's so tragic that uh, we can lose lives like that. And, you know, I think it's kind of a statement of, of um, where our culture is right now. We've, we've got to go after the uh, the people who, who sell the, the drugs and we've got to make our culture better so that, that people don't 
feel like they're struggling so much that they want to escape like that. And it truly breaks my heart. And, and everyone else that, that uh, lost family members, and um, I just wanted to say how much it has impacted me. And um, I attended the cultural council meeting, the um, youth commission meetings, and the, the breed act. And, um, I guess that's it. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry that so much tragedy has happened here in Columbus City in the last couple of weeks. Any other council members? Okay, um, participated in the NADA, meet NADA meeting last week. Um, I continue to be dismayed by that organization because it seems like all they really care about is I-25. And if you're not on I-25, they don't seem to care about anything else uh, to include 84th Avenue and I-25, but we'll continue to participate because we're supposed to, but it's uh, frustrating. Um, also had the uh, Veterans Commission uh, meeting and uh, they are eager to uh, participate in the Memorial Day planning, uh, parade planning as well, and then uh, also participated in that committee as well for the planning. Um, you know, Jen and I uh, share condolences to everybody that has been affected, uh, not just those that have lost their lives and the family members, but the friends and the acquaintances that have been affected by the uh, senseless and tragic death that has taken place last couple of weeks in our city and um, it, it's troubling to get those emails and it's troubling to read those emails and and uh, or even worse uh, before you even get the official notification and it's already broadcast across social media and you're hearing about it from there what's going on but um, you know it's it's one thing to express those condolences it's another thing to have a call to action and to change your behavior and you know uh, speeding is a significant problem in this community you know we had just had a recent news article about speeding on 96th Avenue you know, and, and, you know, if you are bothered by what happened Friday night, then change your behavior as well and slow down. You know, the amount of people that are treating Tower Road as the Autobahn and Highway 2 as the Autobahn, you know, you may not agree with those speed limits there, but they're there for a reason. And whenever you continue to fly up there at 70 and 80 miles an hour on a road that has a 45 mile an hour speed limit, you're putting at risk of recreating what took place Friday night. So please, if you truly do care about what happened in the last two weeks in our city, please change your behavior to make sure that you're not contributing to the next accident that we all have to read about and hear about on the news. Have a good evening. We'll see you next week for a regularly scheduled council meeting.